to welcome you to another episode of the Andrew Gloszewski Experience. I believe this one is going to be episode 231. Going to continue working on some character portraits here. I want to do a companion piece along with this one, one with a little less gear, a little bit more um, of his monstrous transformation stuff happening, where he's a little more monstrous, uh, a little more basic and things like that and see how else I could change it up a bit but I imagine a lot of it's gonna be similar but hopefully it's gonna be different enough where we get some uh, get some differences and yeah other than that man uh, I'm G Mr. Drew at G Mr. Drew on all socials follow like and subscribe links are in bio check out my website G Mr. Drew dot art uh, plenty of stuff on there contact me through there all that sort of stuff you can see all sorts of works that I do let me kinda get this going man I think I really need to find a, a proper light I, I was looking at my some recent uh, streams and yeah the quality of them are still going down but I think it's more of a light thing like just uh, my camera isn't all that special and uh, so it doesn't like necessarily work great with a uh, low light and not that I'm in low light I have three lights here I got uh, a main a fill and a side light and it's still uh, like this quality so I think it's uh, more on the camera so I need to probably get more sh more stronger lights more powerful lights for my uh, uh, whatchamacallit for my camera to be able to capture the video better and my artwork better. I brought the the uh, camera closer so that way we're at least a little bit closer so hopefully that helps as well. Anyways, uh, after a longer than I expected break I forgot I had to do my laundry so I, that took like an hour and so here we are you know an hour plus later and now I'm back and I got Luke Stevens playing in the background. It's a three hour uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla uh, Breakdown it's the second one that he's done. He did one before I watched it It was awesome and then he, he did a second one to follow up I'm guessing maybe because of a patch or something and he's doing a critique on the game plus his old critique all mashed together like I don't know, it's a crazy three-hour video, so I, we're about two-thirds through that, and uh, yeah, man, he's just going in through everything. I would definitely say check him out, man, Luke Stevens. He breaks down video games or whatever, and yeah, I like his videos. Anyways, let's let that rock in the background, and let's get started. Let's hope I could actually draw something here. Anyways, and even that is something that most players are ignoring because they find it monotonous. And the other piece for long-term goals is, of course, upgrading your village itself, your camp, I suppose, is what it starts as. You can upgrade all of these houses, these structures, they give you access to new activities and things that you can do. It requires crafting materials you get as you raid the world, but it's really not that interesting on the whole. The extent of the transformation to your camp is that there's a new building in place of where a tent used to be. It's not actually that awesome when you think about it. In fact, the only thing of note that's going to affect gameplay for an extended period of time are the missions that you'll unlock as you upgrade these buildings, such as gaining access to fishing challenges or hunting challenges once you unlock those respective hunts. Going all the way back to Assassin's Creed Unity, at least when you were working in the restaurant, you could upgrade different elements of it. There was a clear visual change and improvement, not just to that specific item you upgraded, but as the entire structure and building business improved, you saw more customers coming in. You saw yourself making more money from that, which actually had a real impact on gameplay because coin was important. All of that had an effect, and it was worth it because it was like your baby, whereas the camp in Valhalla, I found to just be kind of bland and wasn't a place I particularly enjoyed spending time in. So we've established that there's not much that's going to keep the player going to the very end, other than perhaps just a desire to be done with it and actually see the end credit, or an invested interest in the story itself, whether that's the Isu storyline or 
or just the main story of Ivor, Sigurd, and the clan. What makes all this even worse is that the game's pacing in the early game, specifically once we reach roughly 20 hours or so in, starts to take a nosedive. And uh, a lot of that has to do with throwing way too much at the player too early and failing to develop many of these concepts in those opening stages. So that by the time you reach hour 20 or so, you feel burned out, you don't need to do anything else, nothing's been really developed or grown on, they threw everything at you too quickly, and you're just left bored. I think part of this is that they throw so much at you in the first 20 hours that a lot of players will find it overwhelming. And because it's not developed clearly before they tack on the next gameplay element, you just never really learn to use it or what the point is, because often there isn't a point. I think the ideal is that they would have so much content that you could effectively take your pick as to what you wanted to do and only bother to engage with the systems that were your favorite, but if that was the case, it just ended up leading to a very disjointed experience. You see, systems like fishing, hunting, rapping, drinking, the in-world game, or log, all of these are here, but fail to feel truly fleshed out and fully integrated into the main story and the mission design. I hate to bring it up again, but probably because side quests were cut, and now the only engagement with these systems you can get is usually with small world events that last on average, three minutes, as we established earlier, or main story missions. And most of those main story missions don't touch these systems, like, at all. Fishing is probably the worst offender. I can't actually think of a single time in the main story where you actually use it. Granted, it could be there, and I just forgot. I mean, the game is 100 hours long, and it's possible that after the tutorial section, which is technically a part of the main story, I think, they do touch on it, and I just forgot. I, I really don't know, but that, I would say, is even proof right there. It's not used enough to the point where I can't even remember if it was used. At least in Red Dead Redemption 2, they integrated all of these systems that they had into the main story, and then also side things that you could do as well, like when they used their fishing system in the quest where you teach the kid, in this case, a young Jack Marston, to fish. And it begs the question, if a game designer puts a feature in the game, is it in the player's best interest to engage with it, even if the system isn't the most engaging, or at the very least initially? Is it sort of an acquired taste type of thing? And I think there isn't a definite answer to this. I think it's different on a case-by-case -case basis, of course. However, in general, I think if a team of designers include a feature after years and years of iteration and refinement, it was likely included for a reason. Hopefully a good one. The problem is that Ubisoft has built a reputation for themselves where they include so much bloat that players tune out some parts of it and deeply engage with others. It could very well be that the designers of Valhalla never really intended for players to engage with the hunting systems, the order, the raids, the base building, main story, and fishing, all at the same time. Maybe you're supposed to just pick what stands out. But if this is the case, I can't help but feel as though there's a more efficient way of introducing these systems to the player. Because so much is thrown at you in the first three to five hours alone that I think many players will just forget how much is there. Speaking for myself, I completely forgot that fishing was a thing from like hour five to fifty. Forgot being a <laughs> that he 
had with developers. One of the conversations that he mentions was with a set designer that worked on Uncharted 4. Specifically, they described a system that they had built where Nate and Elena would be able to ballroom dance with each other in the living room of their home. It was supposed to be a cute bonding moment, and the player would rhythmically press X or square or triangle or circle in time with the rhythm. And it seemed like a fun idea. After all, it could build the relationship between the two characters, while also allowing for greater player to be What could possibly be wrong with this? But the lead designers at Naughty Dog understood just because you have a feature that's working doesn't mean that it should be included. There's more to it. The developer explained that it felt markedly out of place. Sure, it was engaging, but it didn't do anything to further the experience they were trying to craft. It felt much more like a random dance sequence in Final Fantasy VII than it did a valid gameplay addition to the next flagship narrative title. So, even though they had this feature up and running, and I'm sure that's what I gotta do. Or even months All right. working on it, they decided to cut it from the game entirely because it, quote, just didn't feel right. And this is the point. It really seems to me that Ubisoft struggles with cutting the bloat and providing a lean experience. The stories are always fantastically long, the pace is usually tortoise-like, and there are so many ways to engage with the gameplay loop that it often doesn't even feel like a loop, instead resembling a knot of hair pulled from a shower drain. Now some players of Valhalla will love this, I'm sure. They love having everything at their disposal, all of these systems, even if they're not used a lot elsewhere. However, it turns a lot of people off. Say what you will about it, but when players are overwhelmed, they tend to shut down. It's the same reason why so many people are so intimidated by large MMORPGs or a lot of JRPG titles. Now granted, Assassin's Creed at this point is known for its vast amount of content and systems. However, it's my opinion that Valhalla takes it just a little too far. And the result is that we have an experience that is extremely overwhelming for the player, and it takes 30 to 40 hours to fully grasp and become comfortable with everything that they throw at you. Sure, when you write out all of the systems and mechanics, it doesn't seem too daunting, but when engaging with just a few is usually enough to hold a player over for 10 to 15 hours, having a laundry list of features becomes much less appealing. And I really think this is why I had such a roller coaster experience with the game. There were some parts of the game I really enjoyed and engaged with and found interesting and unique. Then other parts of the game I just was totally uninterested in. And then the developers themselves seemed to have just forgotten about them and gave up on trying to get me sold on them. So I just gave up on them as well. And then like 15 hours later, they remember that they had this system that they needed you to engage with, so they ask you to engage with it again. And it's just too much. They didn't implement it well. And really, it just reaffirms the idea that because of working from home and because of lack of communication within the team itself, we ended up with a lot of systems underdeveloped and poorly communicated to the player. Now, the last thing I want to address in this section before we get into combat and all of that is uh, romancing. I couldn't find a good place elsewhere in the outline and script to put it, so I'm just throwing it here. I don't know where else to put it. There is romancing in Valhalla, you can uh, chase down, for instance, Sigurd's girl and get with her. It's here, but it's never really satisfying. <laughs> it's never really pay off, you know? Um, there are some interesting moments, such as with this French chick in Essex. They're all just very bland and kind of lame. But I had to mention it. It's here. There are romancings. You can go with, but it, it's just always a little underwhelming. Okay, let's talk about combat. The first thing we should discuss is probably the one that was most hotly contested and debated, and that is stealth and the idea of being an assassin in an Assassin's Creed game. Let me put it this way. Valhalla does have stealth systems. You can play in a stealthy way in some situations. But stealth is only as good as the quest that you're engaging with using that system. And in the case of Valhalla, the levels, the world, and the quests are just not designed for stealth. They're hardly at all. For instance, there's this one where you need to assassinate this guy in this public square. It's pretty straightforward. Classic Assassin's Creed quest makes sense. There's a couple ways you can get to him. Basically, you can either stealth up right behind him or you can climb on the pillars and the ropes above him. So you get close to him and you 
assassinate him. The thing is, the second you do so, you'll engage everybody in melee combat. Everybody and their mother is going to come running at you, and you can either fight it out, or you can escape again, pretty much just by running away. Very seldom are there locations for you to hide within the level or the specific area itself. Usually you're expected to just sprint in one direction until the guards stop chasing you, and then you return back to finish the quest. And that's pretty much how 90% of these levels are designed. Alright, got a little bit of a different pose. I had his head turned the other way, so... Hopefully this will give us a little bit more, but like I said, I'm going to follow some similar tropes that I did in the last piece. But obviously, let's, let's make it different, right? Let's not draw the same things over and over. Especially if we're working with different concepts. Go for that, instead of spending 10 minutes trying to sneak up into an initial... It just doesn't make sense. And this is the thing, ever since Assassin's Creed developed a fairly robust melee combat system, I would say the first really robust one was with Origins. Um, however, some people would say that uh, Syndicate, for instance, had a really solid melee system. But I would say the first really robust melee combat system was with Origins. And ever since that day, they have relied on it for pretty much every quest that they designed. It's the ultimate fallback. If you have a, a quest where there's some sort of stealth option to get to a set location stealthily, if there's ever an issue, you can just fall back onto melee. Guards discover you, just fall back onto melee. You don't need to reload, you don't need to try again in a more stealthy way or try a different route. That's just not a thing. Just fall back on melee. There's probably three or four quests over the course of Assassin's Creed Valhalla where you will need to reset and they say specifically you have to do this stealthily. The leader in every single one of those quests is a melee fight, which again just kind of defeats the purpose of stealthing your way through any section to begin with. I mean, on the whole, I really don't know what else to say about stealth. It's here, sort of. It's just not a priority for Ubisoft anymore with these games. They put so much effort and time into crafting uh, systems for gear, for armor, for weaponry, for, for enchantments for those weapons, for runes, for everything related to combat on a hand-to-hand -hand level, that there's very little time left over on the back end to think about stealth and how you're going to make that meaningful or important. So, it's here, it's not a priority if you're looking for that in this game, you're not going to find it. I don't know what else, I mean, I can keep complaining about it, but this has been the case since Origins, and I think it's going to keep being the case moving forward. So anything I would say here, I've said before a thousand times in the critiques of those games, so I just, I won't bother. Now as for the melee combat, the weapons do feel significantly heavier, which is what you would expect in a Viking game. It's something that was promised to us by the developers leading up to the game's launch, that they wanted to make sure the combat reflected the feelings of being an actual Viking. So that's a double-edged sword or perhaps I should say hammer, because every single weapon that you'll use pretty much feels like a variant of a hammer. In some cases, they even share the same exact animations between weapons. At least the animations are so close, I can't tell the difference between them. Axes, maces, swords, hammers, all of it feels the same in Ivor's hand. It's a big heavy metal thing that he's going to hit people with. <laughs> it's usually thing that feels like a major step back from Odyssey when they had all these different variations of weapons that felt markedly different. There are a fair number of weapons to be used in Valhalla, of course. The biggest one that just recently came to the game in a post-launch patch was single-handed swords, something that they didn't have before. But now, they do have it. It feels fine. The point is, though, everything feels very heavy and punchy. In Odyssey, in Origins, many weapons felt light, felt airy, felt as though they had some impact but not much, and it was about landing a volume of hits as opposed to just a single one. In Valhalla, though, everything is so punchy for the sake of making it feel as though a Viking is... You know, speaking it. of weapons, I was watching, um... I was watching a video by... Spear Hunter. Man, I'm forgetting people's names. I don't know why I'm so tired. So I was watching a video by Spear Hunter. She was talking about DMC, uh, the, the 
Devil May Cry uh, reboot game that was, you know, less successful than uh, anticipated. And, uh, she, you know, it was made by the same, uh, what was it, Ninja Theory? And and they uh, they were the team that made Heavenly Sword, which was like one of the first PS3 games, like big PS3 games. And that was, you know, I was still playing games back in the PS3 era. I was super into Heavenly Sword. It was like one of the first games I played for the PS3. So, um, yeah, she was talking about DMC. And because of that, she was talking about Heavenly Sword. And I was remembering as she was talking about it, the weapons class that they had. And I remember there was like three settings. They had like the, the average weapon, the, the light weapon, and then the heavy weapon. Seems like Assassin's Creed could benefit from trying to make you know, weapons, like, transition that way, uh, have, you know, heavy double sword, broad swords be, like, the heavy weapon in, in, in whatever, heavenly sword and light weapons and whatever. I need some water. I understand why they did it. What the loadouts that stood out to me would be like dual hammers, they're fun, two-handed axes are heavy enough to be fun as well. The shields, I'll be honest, never really felt viable or necessary. <clears throat> Dodging and movement is quick enough that you don't really need to play very different. Dude, shield weapons. I played uh, Mega Man Zero on the Game Boy, and you had a shield weapon in there. It was a you know, just a shield, you get to be like Captain America, basically, because you throw the shield and you use it to block. It's pretty dope. Developers are expecting players to play in any sort of defensive way either. There's also a lot of weapon effects and rooms that are an interesting attempt at introducing item complexity, which is good to see as well. However, I found myself finding the weapons that I like to use, and I use them for 10 hours at a time. 20 hours at a time, which is, of course, a lot. I really wish there would have been a reason for me to experiment with different weapon types, to swap out the weapon I was using for a different weapon that had a different status effect or something of that nature, but there never was any reason to do it, because, going back to the leveling system, nothing encourages you to swap out this gear. I don't want to repeat myself too much, but... Again, Odyssey had this fixed. They had it figured out. Weapon variability, different status effects, and things that you could do paired with abilities to the runes or engravings on the weapons themselves. All of that was just solved. They had it figured out. And then they tried to reinvent the wheel with Valhalla, and it's just not as good in my opinion. Maybe I'm just an Odyssey fanboy. Maybe I just like that system way more, and so this one feels clunky and just bad, but that's how it feels to me. But all this leads us to the issue of difficulty and balance. We've talked a little bit about how different areas are balanced poorly compared to others, but I don't think I made it expressly clear how easy the game is even when you're not using XP boosts. Now until very, very recently, almost for a whole year that the game was out, there was no level scaling, it was if you were overleveled for an area, they were just going to be extremely easy. That's all it was going to be. There was no solution uh, for players like me when we played the game at launch and in the months following. Now there's a solution with the hard level scaling, but even that, I would argue, hasn't really fixed the problem, because the game itself is just, it's too easy. I went through the whole game on very hard, because it was the only thing that kept the game engaging in combat. They throw so many enemies at you that they want to make sure you feel as though you're just a Viking blasting through hordes of enemies, crushing skulls, and living that Viking fantasy. The result is, to balance it, they decrease the health bars of those enemies, even when you're directly comparable in level, such that it only takes a few hits with a decent weapon to either knock them down and move on to the next one, or to rip their head from their body. It was actually quite frustrating. I ended up changing out armor sets and weapons to try and make the game more difficult for myself because it was the only way that I could feel any 
some sort of challenge while playing to keep it interesting for the hundred hours I had to keep going. The only exception to this rule of the game being too easy, I would say, is the instant assassination toggle. Thankfully, there is a toggle in the menu, which I did turn on. This was more just for sake of my own immersion. I find it really stupid that you could dive on somebody from 30 feet up, shove <laughs> a blade into their cranium, and it wouldn't kill them, which is what it is by default. By default, if you are underleveled beneath somebody, you can't necessarily one-shot assassinate them which just hurts my brain, so I turned on instant assassination. Other than that, everything else I had was to try and boost the difficulty. And even on stream, like last week, I went and we played through this section of the game where I was underleveled by 40 levels. We loaded up a save where I was level 300, and we went to an area that was level 340. I was playing on the hardest difficulty, and even then, fighting this weird nun lady was remarkably easy. And listen, it's not that I'm, like, so good at the game. It's just so easy. Like, I'm not very good at video games. That should tell you how stupid this is. Now, balancing video games is incredibly difficult. I'm not going to pretend as though I could just explain how they could fix this and change it. All I know is that Odyssey and Origins found a way to introduce actual challenge when you were playing through them for the tens upon tens of hours you were playing those games. Valhalla never figured it out, and I'm not exactly sure why, but no matter what I did or what I do now, the game still feels too easy. Even when I'm in an area that is 40 levels higher than me. And because of this, all of the boosts wow. and the different things that the game throws at you to help make combat easier, such as the feasts, which give all sorts of damage boosts to make combat easier. Problem is, when combat's already stupid easy, there's no reason to engage with those feasts. So, there are two systems fighting each other, making you not want to use one because the other one is broken. It also made it so certain abilities that you can use and trigger using your adrenaline in combat, such as adding poison or fire effects to your weapons, are also incredibly overpowered because they stack and then add a persistent damage onto the enemy that it's applied to. It's just tough because if you want to engage with all the abilities and systems that you've spent all this time building your character around, you're going to find combat remarkably easy, too lighthearted, and very, very quick. I mean, like I said, look at this thing we found on stream with this nun. We are in the hardest area on the map. We are 40 levels beneath her. We're playing on the highest difficulty and still kick her ass in the span of roughly 60 seconds. Damn. It's just 60 crazy. seconds? Now, speaking of abilities, these are very sure. varied, and the different methods of discovery shake it up enough that I actually started getting excited when I would unlock a new one. Most of these you find while exploring the world, and it's actually a really good way in the early game to encourage players to keep looking in these little crevices and everywhere that you see one of those little dots beckoning you to find what treasures they may hold. One minor frustration I had with these was that some of the really useful abilities are actually locked behind conversations with Haytham at the Assassin's Hut in your clan's village. You basically go to him, and then you have to turn in medallions earned by killing members of the Order of the Ancients. Not really a big deal, but I'm sure that many people will have overlooked this and never unlocked these abilities before quitting the game like 25, 30 hours in. Again, it's just not very clearly communicated. There might be one conversation six hours into the game where Hatham says, Yeah, come to me and give me your medallions from killing members of the Order of the Ancients, and I will reward you with abilities. Like, great, dude, but the game is 100 hours long. In 30 hours, I probably will have forgotten that conversation. Keep it at 100. Again, we can say that it's the player's responsibility to remember what the game communicates to them at any given point and to use all of the systems. But I actually put more of the responsibility on the developer. It's their job, I think, to get the player to the point where they're conditioned to use all of these systems to actively engage with them and know how to use them. It's one of the more difficult parts of game development. 
to take a player and show them how to defeat this thing you created. You're not just trying to create something to screw over the player, you're training the player to defeat it. You create a robust combat system, train the player how to use it to its utmost potential, and exploit all of the enemies using it. It's your job. If there's a system and you only create <laughs> it once early in the game and it's never brought up again, I, I think it's your fault. It wouldn't take much. Only like a dynamic conversation. Maybe Rodri looks at you and says, hey, you have a lot of medallions. You should go speak to Hayden. Something like that. That's been in video games forever. And I didn't have that happen once. Granted, it might be in the game somewhere, but because the game is kind of buggy at times, it's possible that it just never triggered for me. So maybe this is just something I'm complaining about and it's already been solved. I don't know, but that's me complaining about it. So, moving on. Now, if you look at these abilities in gameplay, it's obvious that they're not grounded in the world at all. You're performing crazy jumps, you're applying poison effects to your weapons, that deal crazy amounts of damage very, very quickly. You're doing leaps and jumps and slams and all sorts of things that a human couldn't do. You compare it to the combat in Syndicate or Unity, and there is a big difference. And this has been the trend in Assassin's Creed for years at this point, but it really seems that Ubisoft doesn't take it seriously either, since in cutscenes, the characters don't seem to be capable of doing these moves either. For the most part, these cutscenes are grounded and are realistic. The gameplay is loose, and doesn't care or hold itself to that standard at all. Now again, very personal opinion, very subjective. I personally just, I don't like this stuff. I don't like the crazy supernatural moves. I don't think you need them. I think it's too video gamey. And I, I just personally don't like it. But I know that a lot of people do like it, so it's okay to like it. I just personally don't. But there's a lot of inconsistency here because these supernatural abilities don't just take place in dream realms like Asgard or in combat when maybe just forgive it for sake of gameplay. It happens in the main stories as well. We'll talk more about that in just a second, but first, the cooldown for these abilities. Another thing I just don't like in gameplay. I just really don't like cooldowns. It feels too much like an arcade game or an MMO. You use an ability and then you have to wait some arbitrary amount of time before you can use it again, perhaps sped up by dealing damage or something, but for the most part, it's just a countdown until the game decides you can use this ability again. I get why it's there. You need it so you can't spam one ability 50,000 times, but still, I just don't like it. But with your three life system, like toxicity, could work great here because it achieves the same thing, but it's grounded in the world. Effectively, there's a set amount of time that abilities need before they can be used again, but you can use other skills like fast metabolism to speed up toxicity reduction or something like white honey, which comes with side effect of removing potion effects while zeroing out toxicity, allowing you to take more potions immediately. In the case of Valhalla, perhaps you craft certain potions or something that you can buy in the world, and this allows you to instantly heal up your abilities so you can use them more frequently, or the countdown stops. Just some sort of shifted system so that it's not just a transparent countdown to when you can use it again. Now, okay, let's talk about the supernatural stuff with the rest of the story, the combat, and everything else. These supernatural elements are not consistent at all. Sometimes they make the point that supernatural happenings are just drug or hallucinogen-induced illusions. But other times, Ubisoft seems to suggest that witches and magical characters are actually magical. Let me explain. You see, there are actual curses out in the world of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I can explain away the advanced combat abilities, poison and fire effects on weapons, and all the other unrealistic and fantasy elements involved with gameplay. It's a stretch, but I can do it. However, having actual cursed sites in the world that often come with negative status effects that are only remedied once the player destroys a cursed symbol, it's just too much for me. After all, everyone has different tolerances for this type of thing. For example, in Fallout, there are some people that are just driven absolutely crazy by the fact that there are bottle caps locked in safes that have been locked since before the bombs fell. This would be well before bottle caps were used as a currency, so honestly it just doesn't make any sense at all that people would have locked them inside safes alongside with their actual money and valuables. Most players don't care, or more likely don't even think about something like this. It all just depends on how seriously you take the world that your video game is placed within. 
I honestly don't think that I'm that extreme. I'm somewhere in the middle. I get the most out of games when I'm able to take them seriously, and especially as far as role-playing games are concerned, the world has to make sense within the rules it set for itself. One of my major frustrations with Valhalla is that it's inconsistent. It wants to be a fantasy game while still pretending as though it's historical. And in a setting like ancient Egypt with origins, you can have some more leeway with these types of things. It's further from the present day, which allows the writers to fill in more gaps, but Valhalla isn't actually that distant. Sure, a thousand years is a long time, but we have kept very accurate logs and records from this time. And so much of this world is based on what would make a fun fantasy exploration game and not what would make a grounded world. And it's in that conflict rooted in the very conceptualization of this game's story and world that causes all of this to feel so bizarre. The game just doesn't know what it wants to be, pure and simple. Which is why you can have elements that are very grounded and realistic, and then other elements in times where the game just gives up and fully embraces the supernatural stuff. And there are so many examples I could point to to prove this point. It's frankly overwhelming. You play 20 minutes of Assassin's Creed Valhalla and you'll see what I mean. Whether I look at the seer from the funeral pyre in Snottinghamshire, or you look at all of the stuff that Ivor and Basim do towards the end of the story, that's just not how nature works, it's just clear that the game doesn't know what it wants to be. Granted, Assassin's Creed has always had supernatural elements with the Isu and the first civilization and all of that. I understand that. But that's more like sci-fi, futuristic, but technically like super ancient stuff that's all at play underneath the world itself. We're talking about being grounded within gameplay, swapping back and forth, trying to make up its mind as to whether or not it wants to feel like a grounded RPG in a historical England in which Vikings are exploring and taking land, or if it wants to be a fantasy RPG. It seems pretty clear they're leaning towards fantasy more than grounded in a historical setting. And the last thing about combat that we need to really point out is that sieges and raids, which was one of the major gameplay elements that they really hyped up in the lead up to Assassin's Creed Valhalla, it just, it blows. All of these raids consist usually of setting some basic house models or hut models on fire using torches, killing a bunch of enemies, and then opening a few doors to get to some chests to get some loot, and uh, then a pop-up says you've completed the raid, and that's it. It's very, very samey. They're all copy and pasted. There's nothing new or uh, new. Where's new. my inkbrush? I'm not even sure if you can fail a raid. There you are. To be completely honest. You would think the raid, like, there's a lot of resistance. There's also a lot of enemies that come up and, uh, of course, fight you while you're raiding their village. And, and uh, you would expect, like, maybe they could push you back or you could fail a raid if you didn't do something properly, but... There you are. So do you still work? ...that it's mindless. They're not excited. Oh, you're kind of dry so out. One more oh, thing man. To ...check off the list of the open world. And uh, they, they just suck. I don't know how else to say it. They suck. Siege is also could have been really cool, and this is something I was excited for, especially coming off of the big... Uh, sort of faction battles we had in Assassin's Creed Odyssey where you had two different factions, the Spartans and the Athenians. Oh were yeah, you're kind of dried out, man. Choices. You could have two different generals fighting and you could see the side which way the battle would go. It was really drawn and really interesting. It could have been so cool to see a system like that present here in Valhalla, but it's just not. It's just not. Again, they did all the work for that in Odyssey. They just needed to copy and paste that and bring it here and it would have been great. They couldn't even copy and paste that. They were, like, this is, again, I need to calm down. So much of the game is copy and pasted. And yeah, see? The cool parts that would okay, really so yeah, this, this one's starting to dry out. And it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't cool. make sense. So let me mark this this joint. This, this pen I've been using is a little dry out. That's why uh, some of the lines in here are so thin. Like you could see the tip, and that tip is making those super thin lines. They're supposed to be a little thicker. And yeah, see, I was just testing it out. Like, see these skinny scratch marks, and see these thicker ones. This is from a fresh pen. This is, yeah, it's, it's dying on me. Let me uh, put a little marker on it. Was that I wasn't going to put you through that. 
We could touch on most of the key important elements. Um, that way I could identify this pen as the one that's drawing so I could use it for like other things. I didn't want to have anybody's death from old age on my conscience. So we're going to hit the key points. If you're looking for a story synopsis uh, and you want that video, we can do that. I still have all the footage. Just let me know in the comments. Or look at one of the other story synopses that I'm sure is on YouTube somewhere. But we're going to hit the highlights. This video is long enough. Now at its core, the story of Assassin's Creed Valhalla is a right. series. These are collections of small stories tacked together that have their own individual story arcs, but that tell a larger story over the course of the total run. Think of something like The Office. Every single episode has its own small story contained within that's worth watching and engaging with by itself. But each episode, there might be a small movement in the overarching arc of the story. So over the course of an episode, they're keeping there very go. little in where they're going on the whole. Mm -hmm. But over the course of a season, there's a huge shift and a lot can happen with the characters. All right, let's uh, start inking. Valhalla works the same way. The difference is instead of episodes, we have territories. And each of these you pledge to as you go through the story back at your base camp. Every single one of these territories have Yikes. their own characters that are relegated specifically to that Again, territory. I brought the camera closer, so it's a little... ...can move between territories that will follow you as you go through the main story for half of the story or for the whole story in the case of somebody like Sigurd. It really just depends. The point is, each territory has its own story contained individually separate from all of the other territories meaning that they never really tie together that well other than the overarching story of Ivor, his family, his clan, and everything else that's going on with the Isu storyline as well. And this is actually pretty brilliant on the part of the designers, even though it doesn't work very well, because a character such as the Elderman in Gloucester, or, for instance, Kevdir, who is a character we discussed earlier, these characters play out the story unique to that area in the form of the Halloween Harvest Festival, but after you leave there, those characters are gone. They're relegated to that territory. You made choices in that territory that impacted their lives. So maybe you make a choice, one of them dies, one of them lives. Or this person dies, this person lives. This person comes with you to your village, this person stays behind. All of this. You can make individual choices there, but that territory doesn't affect this territory. So each episode is like its own microcosm of RPG decisions so it can make you feel as though you have a real impact on the world, when in reality, you're just messing little stuff around in this little petri dish, and then you move over to this Damn. petri dish, do stuff over there, and they're all separate. It's not one giant petri dish where every choice, everything you do, infects the other regions. And going back to the previous discussion as to why they cut side content, I think this probably has to do with the development cycle. It seems as though it's a lot easier to develop small territorial stories that are contained individually that you can have different teams working on in each section of the map that broadly follows an overarching story as opposed to having a storyline that's tied all together and works like a giant spider web stretching across the whole of England. Now I'd be okay if the decisions and branching options were actually really awesome. This would be a cool way to do it, have the stories relegated to each territory, but still feel as though you have a real impact on the world. But like I said, it doesn't leave this area, so it's hard to get immersed and to really get to know characters when you only see them, talk to them, and hang out with them for an hour or two while you work through a pledged territory. And furthermore, the characters that do reach across multiple territories, like Rotary or Ivar, have so little screen time in each of those territories that they never really stand out as true friends of Ivor, even though they're supposed to be that. Ivar, Ivar, however you want to pronounce it, I heard characters pronounce it both ways over the course of the story. I'm not sure which I like more. Ivar, Ivar, I don't know. Ivar, we'll go with Ivar. Ivar. <laughs> I don't know. He's probably the closest. When he was revealed to be the king killer, I didn't actually feel that surprised or frustrated when I realized that I probably had to kill him because he was just kind of annoying and he did a lot of things that were irresponsible and downright crazy. So to be offered the chance to kill him and rid myself of him for the rest of the story, I actually found this to be a relief. And furthermore, for a lot of these main story quest lines, there's not actually that much thought put into them. Here's some examples of some really poorly 
thought out moments in quests or quests themselves. The quest Sunken Hope shows two kids who are abandoned. You find out that their father is in fact dead at the bottom of this water-filled tower. So you send them away to travel to their aunt's house. And yes, that's the entire side quest world event thing. There's very, very little to do here. You basically show up, see two kids, they say their dad's gone down. You find him drowned at the bottom of it, so you send them off, and uh, they go to their aunt's house. But the point is, there's no option to escort them, there's no option to help them back to the house of their aunt. Like, this is a deadly world where you get jumped by wolves every 30 seconds, and you just sent two children off to go who knows how far without helping them. Like, I, I wanted to walk <laughs> back to their aunt's house. I figured, ooh, cool, that's where I'll get a reward for helping them. Nope. Ivor says, go to your aunt's house. They leave, and then that's it. Very poorly thought through, or poorly executed, one of the two, or perhaps both. Or, for example, when you're heading into the ancient structure at the very end of the game, right before the final boss fight with Sigurd, you find an icy outcrop, and you hop out of the ship. And Sigurd says to all of his men to stay in the boat in the freezing cold, in the middle of a blizzard, and tells them to wait. Now, I thought this was weird when I was playing through it the first time, because I was like, hey, man, it seems really cold. Why not let them, like, set up a camp or something? Light a fire? Go somewhere where there's trees or cover? Something. But instead, he tells them to wait. And this has made all the worse when I realized that Sigurd knows where he's going and really honestly believes he's about to go to Valhalla forever. He doesn't plan on coming back to the ship. <laughs> and this is just, like, totally ignored. And I know what you're thinking. Maybe it's not actually that cold, and these men aren't actually going to die sitting in this ship waiting for your return. But they repeatedly say, on the way to this location, and once they're out of the boat, that it's so cold they're worried they're going to die before they reach their destination. <laughs> it's so cold they could drop dead within minutes of leaving the boat. So what do you think is going to happen to all of these men that you're asking to just sit in the boat for potentially days or weeks while you chill in Valhalla? <laughs> like, what? This actually painted my opinion of Sigurd, like, severely, even though I don't think it was supposed to. He's supposed to be, like, a man that cares about his clan, that cares about doing what's right, and is very noble and worthy of respect, even though he straight up knew he was going to a place where he was never going to come back, that everybody in that ship would be left for dead and would die if they followed his command. All it would take would be a line where Sigurd says, okay, go back, leave, find somewhere warm and take care of yourselves. Don't and take back, care of yourselves. It's kind of messed up. But at the same time, while there's these quests that are really poorly thought through, there are other quests that are fantastically well thought through and are actually kind of sweet. Such as Pearson's story, where he wants to kidnap his own wife so that she can escape and get a new life. All so that he can then marry his one true love, like his, his teenage crush, and you help him facilitate all of this. It's awesome. I love the quest line. I thought it was really sweet. And to this day, it still stands out as one of my favorite quest lines in any Assassin's Creed game. It's really pleasant and uh, really sweet. I just found it kind of cute and very memorable. But the point is, it's very, very inconsistent. So some quests are very clearly thought out and have strong reasoning to them, and others are just like baffling and awful and change how you look at characters you're supposed to love and look up to. Let's touch on what all of this was building up towards. All of this, this hundred hour experience of choices and making different decisions in all of these territories. What does it come back to? How long ago do your choices have an impact on the main story? Well, it turns out pretty far back. You see, at the very end of the game story, you are judged on all of the major decisions that you've made over the course of the campaign. And to be honest, this surprisingly feels quite fair. Some RPGs often feel fairly arbitrary as to which decisions have a significant impact and which don't. Cyberpunk 2077 is probably the best example where only a few statements in a junkyard can make or break the ending you get. If you want to hear all about it, I'll leave a link to the critique in the description where I actually on stream went back and found every single hidden decision that led to the hidden secret ending and uh, 
It's pretty underwhelming, but I'll save that for that video. Links. Now, based on your decisions over the course of the campaign, Sigurd will choose to either remain with you and your people in England, or he's going to stay behind in Norway and find some sort of new life there. This is based on five main choices over the course of the game. There could be others, but everything I've read and all of the research I've done shows that it's these five choices, and whether or not he comes with you depends on if you've done three of them. If you've done two, he'll come with you back to England. If you've done three, he's staying behind, and he's not going with you. The first is whether or not you stole Strangjorn's cargo at the very beginning of the game when you leave Norway for England. This is a decision that feels like it's going to have a real impact when you make it, and sure enough, it does. Basically, if you do this at the very end of the game after defeating Basim, after dealing with all the fake Valhalla stuff, he sits down and he tells you how bad of a person you were for betraying uh, your family like that, which is just... I felt like a kid that had messed up and I was being lectured to. It felt really bad. The next one is whether or not you start a relationship with Renvi while she's still with Sigurd, which honestly is fair. Like, I started a relationship with her while she was still technically with Sigurd. Felt bad about it. Not bad enough to stop. So, you know what? That was fair. The next is whether or not you punched Basim when you guys got in an altercation. Whether or not you denied Dad his axe and entry into Valhalla in turn. And whether or not you contradicted Sigurd towards the end of the game and his decisions with the settlement and the inhabitants because there was a little spat that you walked in on. The last one feels less fair because he's acting like a crazy person leading up to it, so I think to defer to his judgment is a real test of your loyalty. I stood up to him because he was acting like I said, like a crazy person. But all of the others feel fair, the Basim uh, implication for fighting and punching him, I guess you could say, is a judgment of your temperament and whether or not you can keep a level head, but all told, the decisions that impact the ending feel fair, to be honest. I mean, all told, the ending impact on the rest of the game, the end game, when you are playing after the story ends, it really doesn't matter whether or not Sigurd is there. It's not going to have any major implications for you, but it does have a story implication, which is the point. As for the rest of the story, there's of course a lot of elements of the Isu storyline, Layla being mirrored with Desmond all over the place. There's some interesting parallels that they draw between the Dream Realms and the in-game realm in England, basically implying that Basim is in effect Loki or a Loki-like character and Ivor is an Odin-like character, which is why when you go to Asgard, those presentations are drawn in that way. And there's even similar things that they do, such as having the characters and voice actors that played all the Isu characters going back in the franchise for a decade, playing the characters of the gods in that Asgardian flashback, flash forward, flash sideways thing that you uh, experience in the dream realm. There's a lot going on there. And it's something that's so complicated, I'm not sure if I fully understand it, and I don't think many other people do. In fact, I actually did a survey asking my audience, which is fairly into Assassin's Creed, I mean, you're, if you're watching this video, and the overwhelming majority of people can't explain Assassin's Creed's uh, main storyline with regards to the East Sioux, the first civilization, all of that. It's just not really a priority for people, maybe it's poorly communicated, maybe there's 15 other different things
use with the modern day storyline here that surely is going to have some sort of major impact uh, at the end of the day to where all of this ends up. So I think Assassin's Creed is about to change. I just don't know how. And finally, we've reached a conclusion. Let's try to tie all this up with a bow. All told, I think Assassin's Creed Valhalla was an interesting idea. They wanted to put Assassin's Creed in a setting that really doesn't seem like it would be that friendly to it. They did the best with what they had, and uh, we got a game that stays true to the idea of living a Viking fantasy, but fails in almost every subcategory that you could look at and judge the game against. I think the combat is a notable step down from Odyssey. I think the gearing and leveling systems are all major steps backward. There's tons of features that were developed in Odyssey that are just completely absent in Valhalla for seemingly no reason. In fact, I think in many cases they would have made the game significantly better, um, such as the warring faction system that they had in Odyssey that's just completely absent here. That would have been so cool. Different tribes of Vikings fighting against each other to take territory it would have fit so well with what they were trying to do here. And it's just not present at all. There's just so many things that are inexplicable and don't make sense to me. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why they would make all these changes, why they would cut certain things, why they would pursue these different things. I can't make sense of it, and the only explanation I can come up with is that there was some sort of COVID impact, that there was some sort of change in how they designed and made this game compared with how they normally would make a game like this uh, as a result of the pandemic and working from home and all of that. But that excuse only goes up until January of 2020, March of 2020, depending on where the offices were and when they went into lockdown. And I can't imagine that all of these things could be blamed on that because that's only, what, like six months, seven months? Like seven to eight months of development time, realistically, before they went gold, that they were working from home. And I can't imagine that the whole of the main story, the side quests, the weird shift in the leveling system, I can't imagine all of that was done in the last seven months of development. Maybe. Who knows? But I highly doubt it. So the only conclusion I can come to right. is that they Let's were see. trying to change a lot and shake it up, and it just didn't work at all. The other implication and the other piece to this puzzle is, of course, the, the scandals that have been going on at Ubisoft. Ashraf Ismail, who is the lead director on Valhalla, he was the lead gameplay director on Origins and Black Flag, he was caught up in a, a scandal where effectively it looks as though, allegedly, he was using his role as director of all of these Assassin's Creed games to talk up fans of the franchise, female fr uh, fans, female fans, and was leveraging his position within Ubisoft and within the franchise of Assassin's Creed to effectively cheat on his wife. He lied Damn. multiple times that he was married and, and all sorts of things like that. And he uh, was caught up in this scandal, went on a leave of absence. I don't know if he's still at the company. I don't know if he's still working on Assassin's Creed. I, I really don't know. Last I heard, he went on a leave of absence. And um, at the very least, even if he is still at the company, still working on Assassin's Creed, I doubt he is going to be public facing ever again. But that scandal could have thrown a wrench in all of this and changed the direction multiple times. So, you know, the last minute refinements and cutting of features and things couldn't and didn't happen the way it normally would have with a game like this. So that could have had a huge impact on this. And that would make sense to me. There's, of course, also been a lot of turmoil within Ubisoft, allegations of abuse and improper management and things like that. And so that possibly could have led to, to issues. But everyone I've spoken to who works at Ubisoft, um, a lot of employees, even some high-up people, I know for a fact, do watch my videos and critiques. So, hi, if, if you're one of them. Um, I honestly do appreciate you being here and, and watching.
watching and absorbing. I mean, if you made it this far in the video, Jesus, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, critiques and criticism seriously, so props to you, truly. But everyone I've spoken to who works at Ubisoft says that the process was pretty smooth, like all things considered. The studios are working well together, and other than, you know, the stuff we've heard about Ubisoft Singapore, everything else and all of the other studios are working pretty well and aren't running into a lot of issues. So I really don't know what went like what happened and why it happened. I have some ideas, and there's some disjointed stuff, but more than anything, I think the simplest explanation is probably just that this was an experiment that failed. They were trying to do something different with a lot of different systems, and it just didn't work. My fear, though, is that Ubisoft is going to look at Valhalla and say, well, yeah, like, we aren't that happy with some of the review scores, but it sold really well. And the players speak. You know, the customer is always right. And if the customer was really happy with Valhalla, we're just going to do everything the same next time around. And with the next Assassin's Creed game, we're going to have no side quests. You know what? Cut it. Screw it. We're going to cut main quests, too. Let's just cut it all. <laughs> like, who knows? Like, that, that very well could happen. And I hope that doesn't happen. Because, in my opinion, there are so many pieces of the puzzle in Valhalla that just don't fit together at all and need significant reworking. My fear is that that is going to be drowned out by the commercial success of the game, the fact that it sold quite well. So we'll just have to wait and see. I'm excited to see how the DLC affects all of this. Of course, we did have the first major DLC expansion come out. There's more coming down the pike. And if you would like me to do a critique of all of the DLC like I did with Odyssey and Origins, let me know in the comment section. I actually would honestly like to know if you'd be interested in hearing all of that. Uh, I'd be happy to do it. I haven't touched the DLC yet, so some of the complaints and critiques and criticisms I made here, I'm sure, have been partially addressed there. But all told, I'm excited to see where the franchise goes, but I'm also concerned that they aren't going to learn the lessons that should have been learned here, because there are a fair number of them, to be honest. As for the elephant in the room, Assassin's Creed Infinity. This was a story that broke that I kind of need to uh, address here. Um, effectively, we just know that they're working on some large live service version of Assassin's Creed. It's very, very early in development. We're talking like 2023 to 24, more likely 2024 to 25 is when we would ever see any possible uh, version of it. All we really know about it is that it's a live service, living, breathing version of Assassin's Creed. And honestly, at the outset, that doesn't sound like an inherently bad thing. Think of one Animus with one character, like effectively what we had with the Layla trilogy, with Origins, Odyssey, and Valhalla, where you have one character that can go to these different realms together off of one Animus or in one platform. And there could be co-op, there could be all sorts of things that I think could be interesting. It could work pretty well. The danger is that it's going to be a huge shift away from the you know, single-player linear narrative, or, or rather RPG narrative experience. So we'll have to see how all of this works and how it shifts and what it looks like. Um, but I don't, I don't see the, the point in getting heated or dramatic about it right now because we don't know anything about it. Like, whatever I would be frustrated with and yelling about would be a straw man because it doesn't even exist yet. I'd be inventing something to be upset about and then being upset about it for sake of clicks and views and that's not why you guys watch me. Nope. I know for a fact and maybe you've told me like you don't want to keep the level head anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, I try very hard. I, I don't want to lean into all of that. When we find details out, and when we know what it's actually going to look like, I'll talk about it. I'll break it down. I'll say if I think this is good or bad. As of right now, we just don't know anything. So there's not much to say, really. To wrap up Valhalla and everything, I, I was hoping this would be a really cool experience, uh, a really cool Assassin's Creed in a Viking setting. What could go wrong? Turns out pretty much everything. I haven't played a game where almost every system had a huge issue in a very long time. Even something like Cyberpunk, there were many elements and systems there that were really good. You know, side quests, they're all phenomenally well written, structured, gameplay's interesting, it's just broken. Like the, the tech can't keep up with it. Here, it's just like across the board. Every time I 
think we're on to something. There's something that just doesn't make sense. Some design change where it's just bafflingly stupid. Like, it just boggles my mind. And I can't really explain it. You know, normally there's a reason, a rhyme or reason to it, but here it just doesn't make sense. They just made choices that were bizarre. The game sold well, and now they're probably going to lean into it and make the same mistakes next time. Will I be playing Valhalla more? Not unless you really want me to. That's why I asked if you could share your opinion as to whether or not you want to see a critique on the DLC, something like this for the DLC, because I think right now, based on how I feel about Valhalla and the insane amount of time I've had to spend with it for the sake of this video, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm kind of sick of it, and I want to move on. But that will be up to you guys <laughs> to decide. So if you want to subject me to more of it, I'm more than happy to. I mean, I, all of this is only because of you guys. You know, well, it's only because of you guys. So if you want me to play Valhalla, okay, I guess I'll play some more Valhalla. The DLC. So let me know in the comment section below. Make sure to follow my Twitch right now. Head over there. Usually after I post a new video, we are live um, to kind of respond. Sorry, my mom's so texting me, so I'm just Twitch, below, making sure I get back to her. Hang out with us. We work in these videos live, as I've said many times in this video. You've seen the footage from those live streams. So head over there, follow us, and become a you know part of that community. It's a great community, and I'd love to have you. I really would. We're growing quick, so if there's ever a time to get into it, it would be right now because we are growing very quickly, and I don't want to leave you behind. You know, I would love for you to be there at the beginning when I can actually still get to know you. So head over there and uh, follow right now. And of course, again, Rhapsody Stream. My mom was. Uh, <laughs> she lives out out of the country. Uh, she, I guess, she was a. a being a live model for a hairdresser or something like that so she just got her hair done for free <laughs> and she's just letting me know she just sent me like pictures i think she was uh going for platinum and then changed her mind and got like a kind of like a platinum slash sandy color hair done yeah, whatever. Five and a half hours to record. Well, I was in these videos. People don't even realize. I actually don't know how long this video will be when uh, we get it out. But from Hermione and I, I don't know if you can see her. That's her color. That little. Oh wow! So it's three hour review is is over. Thank Damn. You I love you all more than you possibly know, and I'll see you in the next video. Hugs and kisses. Wow. No braces, everything's hands-free. I wasn't so lucky. Uh -huh. And this is not your parents' braces. And this is faster than braces. And the Carolina brand most trusted by doctors. We'll fix our handle. Yeah, I'm drawing right now. Alright, we're live. Uh, this is going to be a fun one. Thank you, everyone, first of all. For Hold on. Okay, can I draw a handle? No. Uh, I'm drawing. Yeah, I'm trying to take See? my eyeballs out. Gonna, oh. I, I just finished that one earlier tonight, and now I'm working on that one. Nice. Yeah, what uh, what color was that? Because I thought you said you were going with platinum. Oh, and I'm live streaming right now, by the way, so people can hear you. You're, you're, oh. you're, the, you're, you're talking to the world. <laughs> But I thought you were going with the platinum, uh, and then you, you. Oh, I thought you said you changed your mind. No, that's when I sent you the blackbird. <laughs> oh, cause what you were gonna go black, maybe. Now I'm just making a joke. I sent you the black parrot, and I said that was me. I changed my mind. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Dude, I can't believe it took 12 hours. I mean, even my hair, when I first got it done, it took like eight or nine hours. Yeah, but, but see what they do is first they had to take all the dark color that is in there because I still had inside dark color. So they had to take all that color out and they had to wait. They keep 
looking at it. Yeah, they gotta burn it longer, it. or they gotta let it cook longer. Yeah. Oh, but I was the first one at it. There were the two ladies because R one was young, like thirty-five. She said. Oh wow. Her hair was completely black. <laughs> I don't think I took a picture of her at the end, and they cut like half of it. Really. She had it long all the way to her butt, and then they cut it up to me me back you know i yeah but they say because it was damaged at the end me they didn't have to cut nada they didn't cut up my hair they told me your hair is perfect because you didn't have i didn't have color i didn't have anything no yeah. chemicals yeah so i like it but I, I mean i don't like them putting makeup i don't like my eyeballs with the makeup like that but for the pictures you know you have to have it and then they make you do a lot of stuff. I'll send you a video on there. I'm, I'm waving my hair. It's really cool, the video. Yeah, you're like a herbal essence commercial. Yeah, right. <laughs> she got the urge to herbal. Man, guess what? What? No food. They offered me a song when I was full of junk on my face everywhere. So I, I, I said, no, I'm not hungry, right? Mm-hmm. I'm starving now, but it's too late to eat, so I just... Uh, you should have took the bed. sub and held on to it. Huh? You should have just took the sub and held on to it. Mm, I didn't think of it. Yeah, you didn't know that it was going to take that long. Yeah. Yeah, and then they had to... They had to wash. They had to give you a conditioning in your hair first. Mm-hmm. And then they had to wash it really good with good products. And then they put something else for another 20 minutes. And then they wash your hair again. And then they had to blow dry it. Then they had to do a ironing. And then they do the makeup. And then they do a session pictures with lighting and, and uh, what's it called? The... The thing that blow air? A yeah, blow dryer. No, a, a big one for the room. A fan? So you move a fan. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they put a fan and then you do pauses and <laughs> stop it. And then at the end, they do an interview and you have to say, how do you feel about it? You know, so, yeah. <laughs> but it was free. Yeah. <laughs> and so I asked them that if I was to go there and ask for this, and I asked them how much it would cost me, and then they told me at least 500. Woo! I was going to yeah. say like 100 bucks, but 500? I used to pay 350 back in the 90s. And up there, remember when they used Shit. to do just a little streak of color on my hair? Yeah. That's 350. God damn. Because I had too much hair. Yeah. And this, because I cut it, I cut it last week. It was would, would have been longer. Yeah. But I went to cut the the ends last week, and she didn't cut that much, but she still cut that much. Wow. That so was good. <laughs> so how are you? What's going on with you? Uh, are you still live streaming? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just live streaming, and. Uh... Yeah, just just drawing this character, the same character I've been working on lately, the Cyclops, the one eye with the purple skin. Uh, I'm doing actually a picture. But the, that's a different Cyclops, or the same Cyclops guy. It's the same guy. He he has a whole journey where he changes over the entire oh, story. Like a Dragon Ball Z, black, uh, red hair, yellow hair. Almost. Kind of like, uh, dang, who, who, what kind of character? I mean, Dragon Ball Z, kind of, yeah, but they're more like, oh, they powered up. So because they have a new power, they have a new thing. It was kind of like a good thing that they changed. This guy's more uh, like a bad thing that he's changing. Um, kind of like, uh, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't, I can't think of a bad guy that like transformed for the worse, you know? Like, you know, Ninja Turtles, they have Bebop and Rocksteady, the pig guy and the rhino guy in the second movie. 
they changed and yeah. then they turned into some ugly thing. But even they didn't care, you know, just their characters. They didn't care that they transformed. But like, Have you guys seen any of the new movies? No. No. Uh, I saw Suicide Squad on HBO Max because I watch Bill's HBO Max. Oh, talking about Bill's, is that pool in his house? Yeah. This is backyard. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it has. House. Yeah, it it has a ladder on one end, and then it has like a little island on the other end where it's like shallow, so you can kind of like stand and sit in the water, and they have an umbrella there, and that's where that, I think that picture was taken. Uh oh. Are we losing connection? I think we're losing connection. Is it raining on? Uh, it's raining here. Uh, it rained yesterday, but I don't think it's rained tonight. Oh, it started raining right when I was about to leave, and it started raining, and I'm like, oh my god, just like I need, because if you get the hair wet, it's already <laughs> popping up. Yeah, it's the humidity. Yeah, I see. The humidity was nice, and it's. But as soon as I step out. <laughs> what the heck did I do, you know? Yeah. It is, it's, we have curly hair, what, what can we do, you know? Exactly. So what's been going on with you? Everything good with the bills, work, and... Yeah. Yeah, I got to send out the check for the rent pretty soon, in like the next couple of days. And then, uh, but yeah, every, everything's good. I'm on top of all the bills. I paid everything. And, uh. Yeah, that's it. I. The moto. Okay, now I can see you. Uh oh. We're losing connection. Uh oh, I think we. I think we just. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I think. Connecting. Yeah. Is it yours or is it mine? I think it's yours, just because you got you got caca internet over there. No, because I'm. I can see myself on the picture, and I can talk, and you can hear me. You're the one who froze. I'm like. Oh. Well. Well, no, I could, wow. I could still see myself. I, I keep losing your video. Your screen keeps turning black with the pinwheel. Uh, I see the same thing. Oh, so I don't know. Maybe it's Facebook. I see myself, but I see the... Yeah. yeah they, they're screwing up with us is what happened. Yeah, this is Mark Zuckerberg. But yeah, every, everything's good, you know, work is work, and I'm streaming, and streaming is going well, uh, it, you know, uh, meeting new people every day on the stream, and more people are following, so like that's kind of going up, and and I, I keep... Did you, did Stefan ask me for your email? He so has... I gave him your email. He hasn't reached out to me unless he's in my my junk email. Yeah, you should check Stefan Sawaski cuz I he said something about that the NFT stuff. He said oh Andrew should get into this it's, it's, uh, Yeah, he said what's his so I gave him your email. And your phone number. Yeah, here's the thing with the NFTs, because I already looked into it because people already reached out to me saying, hey, you know, you should get into NFTs since you do digital art. And then I looked into it and I signed up for it. And the way that it works, um, they never got back to me. Uh, the way that it works is, you know how when you buy a statue from a store, like a nice art statue, and it comes with a ticket of authenticity? 
uh, that's what NFTs are essentially. It's the digital version of a ticket of authenticity. That's what separates NFT digital art from every other digital thing that you see out there. Is that it, it, you have to be given this uh, kind of like an ID card or something. You know, you got to get like this special thing that they give you to say like, okay, what you produce now is going to be an NFT and what it does is it lets them track everything that that digital art has done. So they know if it's a copy or if it's the but original. That means, that means, right, but that means you had to pay them because they do that for you? The, uh, I'm, I'm sure like different, there's different ways of doing it, but maybe, yeah. Like they, they get a commission or something? Probably. I, I'm sure there's like middlemen and then there's management involved if there's any of that. Like, I'm sure it's all a certain setup, but that's why it's a very small community. Uh, the whole NFT thing right now is just like a bunch of tight knit uh, rich people who all know each other and some of them know artists. So they just it, it, it's a new way for money, digital money to be transferred in be between rich people. So it's kind of like a rich people asset thing right now. It's not really like a big thing because you hear about these artists who made like sold something for a million dollars, but that probably got divided amongst management, uh, you know, different parties, different groups, you know, it's probably for like some donations and who like who knows? Like, I don't know if, you know, for marketing and even things like that, just to be on the news. You know, I'm sure like somebody probably paid a lot of money in order for just like the news to pick it up and be like, oh, my God, it's so crazy. A million dollars for NFT. And then it gets a bunch of poor artists like me to be like, oh, I want to be NFT artist. And then you sell NFTs for like five dollars and things like that, which is still fair. But, <laughs> you, you know, you're, but you're not. Better to the big box. Exactly. So the only way you're going to make a lot of money with NFTs is the same way how you're going to make a lot of money with regular art, you know, but that's what separates an NFT from a regular thing. Like what I do, all the did, you know, whenever I post on Instagram and Facebook, like those are digital art. And it's the same thing as an NFT, except mine just doesn't have a ticket, a ticket of authenticity. So anybody can just like right click, copy and uh, copy and paste my picture and they could do whatever they want with it. Um, if you have an NFT, they could do the same thing. They could right click, copy and paste it. But all, all of that, all of that traffic from right clicking, copy and pasting, all that gets um, saved as data on, on computers and stuff. So they can track whether or not that that copy and paste that copy is the original image or not because they'll see oh no this picture has been copied three times you know it's it's like when when uh, drug dealers bring drugs in from you know from let's say colombia and it gets it, you know there's a term that they use called stepped on where it's been stepped on by the mexicans and then it got stepped on by the americans and then it got stepped on by your drug dealer until it before it got to you and now you have something that you paid twenty dollars for that's worth five dollars, but because it got stepped on by so many people, it's like a lesser product with like probably fake stuff in it, and and you paid more money for it. Same thing with like the digital stuff. Like everything, when you copy and paste it, it it leaves a stamp. It leaves it it leaves a trail behind it. Um, so yeah, I looked into that stuff. It's interesting. I'd be into it, but I never got the ticket of authenticity from the the company that uh, was giving them out at that moment or whatever. So I signed up, but they never they never got back to me. So I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> Keep doing what I'm doing. So you stay up all night and sleep in the day. Uh, I sleep in the mornings, so I, I, I go to sleep at like around six, six in the morning, and then I wake up at one. You know, I open up the house when I go to sleep, so the sunlight comes in, but I put a, a mask on to go to sleep, like a mask to cover my eyes, so that way it's... You open up, 
if you open up the house, you can hear all the noise. Oh, well, not the windows, the glass save you from hearing all the noise outside. No, no, I, I not open it like that. I mean, I open up the blinds to let the light in. I keep the windows closed. It's too hot for that shit. Um, but I, I just open up to let the light in, so that way when my alarm goes off at 1 p.m., like, you know, the, the, the house is lit, and I'm not, like, living in darkness behind blinds and stuff like that, because that... You found my mask that you gave me? I think it's somewhere up there. I gave you a, a eye mask? Yeah. Uh, I don't No, I, I bought one from like Walmart or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll check my emails to see if Stefan contacted me because if he can get one of those ticket of authenticity things, then I can do artwork for him and then he could put it out there. And then as long as we have a deal where I make a percentage of whatever he sells of mine, then that it could work that way too. You know, step if Stefan has the time to like figure out how to get how to get that stuff or to contact people to get that stuff, I I I'll, I'll draw some stuff for him. You know? Oh, and that's the other thing with NFTs. I think every time that it gets sold, like you sell it to one person and then you sell it to another person and, you know, they keep reselling it. I think a percentage always goes back to everybody who owned it beforehand. I don't know if it just goes to the artist or if it goes to like everybody who's owned a part of that, that piece. But they say every time it resells, like, you, you know, the artist gets a percentage. So let's say I... Royalty. Exactly. Like, it, you know, it, it, it gets resold and you get a piece of it, even though you have nothing to do with it anymore. You just created it. And so that's another thing that's pretty cool about them. But, you know, I'd, 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 be, I'd be down to do it. There's like a lot of cool things I can make, like little animated GIFs or just regular pictures. But, you know, usually people want something special. If it's an NFT, if they're going to be spending money and you want to get a lot of money for it, you got to make something that's a little unique. You know, animated gifts would probably be the way to go. But yeah, I'll ask them. Or I'll, I'll check for them. So how you doing? She was worried, sick, because I was gone for so long. <laughs> I have a friend call her and tell her that everything was good. It was just that I couldn't talk to her, but I could text message my friend, but I cannot text message my mom. Right. So my friend called her, and my friend texts me back, oh, my God. She was almost in tears, not knowing what had happened to you. <laughs> Oh my God! Uh, she's still awake. When I came home. I went into her room. She's still awake, you know. Yeah. I asked her if she ate and everything. She said she ate a little bit. Okay. That's good. Let's well, see. She cares. Y'all act like y'all don't care, but you care. She wants that doggy, you know? Which one, that little, the white fluffy one? Yeah. Hmm. Well, talk to Jose about that, don't, you know? Cause I don't know how much like dog care costs in, in El Salvador, but that costs money, you know? I know, it costs me so if it's gonna... like 15 bucks to, to take the bird. To get a to get it checked, I, I thought I could imagine it's more money. Well, it's not even just to get checked; it's to get shots. You know, especially if it's a puppy that, has, that doesn't have shots. I don't know how El Salvador does it. But but. Right now, they do it. They sell it to you because they have to be at least two or three months old. Mm. They have to have all the shots and no parasites. Right. But yeah, you're right. That that little thing is gonna need care. It's gonna need 
somebody playing with it, you know, running around. Yeah, I know. Because my cousin has one. And when that thing comes here, it's like an earthquake, man. <laughs> but she loves my mom. And she jumps on her and she bites it. And she, I mean, and my mom likes that, you know? Yeah. But, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, it's a good idea because... You know, you're, you're tied up. You can't do much with dogs. You can't leave them all day long or or anything, especially a little one. So, yeah. I mean, unless Jose can help. No. But... Jose, I sent him the picture and I told him. And he goes, oh, nice little dog. That's it. <laughs> did, did you tell him that she wants him? Yeah. And he didn't say anything? Oh. He only say nice little dog. Hmm. No, he doesn't say cock, come in. Yeah. I guess he's consumed in his new world because, you know, he wasn't used to working his ass off all day. <laughs> he was used to being sitting down on a, watching the ocean, you know? Yeah. I, I don't, you know. I still don't get it or how he can give that up, but I I don't know how he can give that up, but I mean, whatever. At this point, it's, you know what? He left 16 years with the city of Deerfield Beach, Mm -hmm. but that was their decision, you know? Yep. But yeah, I, I can't take care of no dog. It's a good looking dog, but that's what I was saying. Just take care of the ones that are there. If you really want to feed a dog and hang out with one, just like whatever those little those little runt dogs right. running around the neighborhood. <laughs> like hell. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they you... smell funky, Andrew. I mean, they if they get close to you, you can smell them, and like, oh my god. Well, yeah. They Flies going around them. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you get that little that little fluffy dog, it's going to smell like shit after a certain amount of time if you don't wash it. So if you're going to wash a dog, you already got smelly dogs around you. Just wash those dogs. That's all I'm saying. Like, I'm not saying, like, take them home and keep them. But, I don't know. If it's a cool dog, give it a bath. And then that'll be your your dog fix. And then after you do that, you're gonna be like, oh fuck that! I don't want any dogs. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to wash any dogs. Fuck. You know. You know. I I remember when Grandpa got got the golden retriever. Whoa. Cause they 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 got him a a golden retriever. Uh, I guess like after grandma passed so that way he wasn't alone but they got him a puppy and that puppy just had too much energy for him like it, like he's still with it and now the dog's old now but back when they first got it it was a puppy and it would like drag him around and I was just like that is not a good mix to have an old person with a young dog you know so even if you have to, like, adopt a dog or I don't know if they have, like, you know, those dog adoptions. What, what do they call those? Like, whatever, kennels or something? Oh, yeah. If, like, you... Pound. Yeah, like, if you... Dog. Yeah. If you can get a good dog from something there, a good-looking dog, at least. Yeah, I think... Uh, I, did you see that Jamie posted that they couldn't have gotten a, a sweet dog? For the boy they have, what's his name? Big, Big, Vincent. I don't know how they have a male dog that they took from Florida from the pound. Oh yeah, they have two dogs, right? Right, but she she posted something, but the boy was sleeping, and he and she said that they could not have gotten a Swedish dog. Oh, uh, I don't know. It's... I guess he's good. Yeah. And, and I mean, they they had one really good looking, 
by people that they found it and nobody claimed it. So they were asking if anybody wanted it to give him a home. They found and one? Was, they found a third dog? Yeah. Oh, they find dogs all the time, I think. and But one never was not claimed by people. So they were asking for people to to take it. Right. Huh. Yeah, whatever. Just bring it to a kennel. Maybe somebody will get it, hopefully, or something. I mean, unless they could take care of three dogs. But that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, if they if they could have three dogs, like, they should be able to help you with one dog. He said that he was going to pay for the phone, and did he say he never asked? He told me to get a phone and that he was going to pay for the phone every month. Mm. That's why the other day I told you not to pay it because he was going to pay it because he he offered to pay. It. But then you paid it and now he's not paying and he's not. Hey, he's not. When we talk, he never brings it up. So I'm just going to keep paying it until unless he pays it before I do. Because if I don't no, pay it, nobody that was, will. That was that was that day, so forget it. Yeah. I'm not asking him. I mean, I guess, you know, he's his own man now with his own home, so nothing to do with us anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's been that way for a while. Yeah, I know. I know. But yeah, that's it. I, that's crazy. Twelve hours, cause I did my hair. It took it took like eight or nine hours. We watched like three but movies said, the entire well, time. They told me, but what happened is they told me to be there by eleven. So I I you always arrive early at a, at, a, at something. So mm -hmm. I arrive at eight thirty. But they were having a class, and the class I listened to the whole class. It was very interesting, you know what they had to do. They explained to them if you mix this with this, what color you're gonna get, and if the color is off, then you put this. And I mean, very interesting. And how they need to write down every single money that comes in, and every single money that goes out, even if they buy a uh, minuta. For 50 cents, they said you had to write it down because then you will not remember that you spent that money and that's part of your income that comes in, right? Yeah. So it was very interesting to listen to all that they had to do. I mean, it's not just, I mean, they explain how the colors go. They, can you imagine? They need to know about haircuts, depending on the hair, depending on this, on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just like that. So that class ended at 12. And that's when they started working on us. Mm. And she told them, if you guys get done by 9 p.m., you, you're going to get a, 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 a point on your test. So they, they're they going to have a test tomorrow. So they got done with me by 9, but not the other two. So she said, oh, no, it was collectively, not just, not just one person. So they were born. You know, they go, oh, man. And so, but hey, it was good. It was good, but it's puffing up. <laughs> well, at least you got the color. And, you know, it, it, it'll be puffy back in like two or three days, back to normal. <laughs> it will be coolly again, so. Yeah, but it looks good. Your, your okay. pictures came out good back at the thing. Was there a whole audience? <laughs> Yeah, there was people there, and then it's kind of funny because you have to do things in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. so, but you know me, huh? I just started laughing and moving, and they were filming and all kind of stuff, so yeah, it was good. It was good while it lasted. Yeah. I think I'm gonna go die die now.
I'm tired. Yeah, what time is it there? Like nine or ten o'clock? I think that's that's normal. Or around how what time is on you? Uh one ten. It's ten after one. Okay. Oh, okay, so down here is ten ten. Okay. It's two hours. I think it's two hours different. Well, three hours, I think, right? Also, it's 11. So it's 11 10 in here. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's two hour difference. Yeah, that was yeah. a whole day. You're going to sleep easy. You I also, I've been sleeping, but it's raining. But you know what happened? It's raining. And there is a drop right outside my window that you can hear plush, 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 plush. And it won't let me sleep. Oh. I can hear that drop, flush, flush, flush. As long as it's raining, man, it sucks. But hmm. what can I do? You know, it, it, you don't know what it does, but it sucks. Did you ever find that book? Did... No, I haven't looked for it, but I will. Oh. I forget to take my medicine that the doctor gave me for the articulations. Um, it tastes like a fruity, sweet, fruity thing, and I don't like sweet stuff, so. Huh. But, yeah, I know I have to do it. But I'm going to look for the book, because uh, I got a book, a PDF, and I read it, and I'm done with it, so I know I have to read again. So I have to find it. It has to be here, somewhere in, in the room. I just had to find out where I put it. Yeah. Yeah, they just okay. released the uh, yeah. the the one trailer for the Eternals and Jon Snow's in it, so that's why I was thinking about it. Yeah. You watch the Eternals uh, trailer, the new one it just came out with Angelina Jolie and Salma Hayek. No, not yet, but, but I think I will. Yeah. I saw something with Salma Hayek, but I didn't see no Angelina Jolie. But I saw other male actors important with her. I don't know if it's... It, she's in another movie with, like, big hunches. Uh, Salma Hayek. Well, it's the it's the Marvel movie. So it's Angelina Jolie, Jon Snow, and the other actor, uh, uh, the, the other son from, uh, from, from Game of Thrones, who was like Jon Snow, but he died at the Red Wedding. Um, oh. The the son, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was his name? Yeah, the one that would have been the king. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what his name was. Yeah, not Ned Stark, but um. Yeah, Ned Stark was the son. No, no, that was the dad. Um, I'm trying to think. What what the hell was the name? Oh well, either way, but you know they're they're both uh in that movie, which is funny. You know, they say that the last the last line that those two brothers or, you know, brothers in quotes, they said to each other in the show or in the books was next time I see you, you will be wearing all black. And uh, they never saw each other again because he died. And uh, in this movie, Jon Snow's character, he plays a character called the Black Knight. So he's still technically seeing him like, oh, the next time we see each other. He's going to be in all black because he's playing a character named Black Knight. Even though it's a whole different like series and show and all that other stuff. So that, that's kind of funny. I don't know if like Disney did that on purpose. Yep. But, I but, remember Sansa. Yeah, Sansa, Arya, Bran. Uh, uh, the other boy... How am I forgetting his name right now? That's so, yeah. that's embarrassing. I'm, I'm forgetting it on screen. Yeah. yeah. I even remember his, uh, his, his wolf's name, which was, I think, Grey Wind, which is like, wh why do I remember the wolf's name, but not his? Yeah. Huh. Anyways, find that book. Go to sleep. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go to sleep. All right. Love you. Love you too. Okay. Bye. <laughs>
Oh. That's my mom, y'all. <laughs> she got her herd did. You know, it's funny, she, uh, I remember growing up when she started getting white hairs, she would always, like, pluck them. Um, and so, you know, she plucked them out. And she spent all those years plucking them, and then, you know, eventually she just gave up. And, uh, in recent years, she stopped dyeing her hair completely. And now she has, like, that whole salt and pepper thing going with the hair. But it's like, you know, doesn't look bad at all. She, you know, looks like like Storm from the X-Men or some shit. Because she has so much hair. And, uh... Yeah, she... <laughs> the, the hair that she got done was, like, to make it platinum. And I was telling her earlier today, I was like, all those years, you plucking out your hair. <laughs> I was like, you should have just, like, succumbed to it a long time ago. And just dyed it platinum whatever, like, 15, 20 years ago would have been, like, a trendsetter, you know? But, anyways. Let's, uh, let's color this beast. And I got David Finch playing in the background. He's got a nice picture of Lobo on screen right now. Um, not his drawing, but he, I guess he's talking about it, maybe? So let's see, 38 minutes in, I'll, I'll just start it from the beginning. Turn up the volume. Uh, oh, my, my speaker turned off because I had the volume down. Hold on. Let's uh let's rewind. Copy from artists that I loved, and then uh, take it and, and just draw them on my own. And I oh, all right. Uh, and then I also did pages less actually, and I found I really struggled with pages when I first started because of that as a problem. So I would definitely recommend yeah work on pages and don't don't leave things that you're gonna need essential skills that you're gonna need when you're starting your first job uh, until you do your first job. Otherwise. Uh, you'll be in the position I was, except you won't have Mark Silvestri as a teacher right over your shoulder saying, no, 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 this is not how you do it, and you know, showing me how to do it. Okay, so I'm going to start with this picture right here. This, and just as a quick little backstory, um, when I started in South Cal, I was very, I'm, I'm still very influenced by Mark Silvestri, and the image style at the time was, it was very much a, and I'll just do a quick, so uh, here's, here's an arm. Don't even really need the whole arm. The point is, the way that we were working, here's my deltoid and my, uh, my tricep. <laughs> Trying to remember the names. Okay, you think after all this time, I at least remember tricep. And the way that I started working after looking at Simon Bisley was the way that we're going to talk about now, and I'm excited about it. But the way that everybody was working is you'd have your main line source coming from above. And so, um, and you'd have basically a line here, this would be your torch shadow, and then you'd have a, a light coming from below. And so I'm going to do a bit of a, and I never got comfortable with this. And it, all the rendering was done kind of sidelong like this. And I'm going loose, so it's Oh, yeah. That's how I'm shading. Like, this is very much a Jim Lee style uh, with Scott Williams, and they did it incredibly well. Louis Patasio was another artist that really, really... Um, made the style incredible, and I loved it. I just could not pull it off, and it was a massive struggle for me for about six months. And so that's kind of the style there. If you guys are pretty familiar with that, um, Stephen Black did it incredibly well. He had like his own take on it, which I loved. I just couldn't do it, and I got to the point where I thought, you know what, this is not working. Like I, I might as well pack up and go home. And a lot of people did, not for that reason, but you know, similar. So uh, Matt Banning, uh, he's an anchor. He's known as Bat. Uh, he's a very good friend, and 
I complained to him about it every, like for days, and he finally said, you know what? Just look at something different. Just find something totally, find something that you like, and just try something different. And so I went through, and I'm a huge fan of Simon Bisley. I had never tried it. I thought it was too out there. I just couldn't, you know, use that because it's not really what we were doing. I thought, you know what? This is not working for me. I'm struggling so badly. I just need to go for it. This figure right here was the first thing that I drew when I first gave it a try. And specifically, actually, it was the leg. And so I kind of want to go through, and let's work on the leg. And that's right here, obviously. So, uh, and after we're done with that, we're going to move on. This stuff is all the color. This is my logo is back, signed by Simon Bisley, by the way. I've got a few copies. So we're going to look at a bunch of stuff in there. But <clears throat> so I'm just going to start sketching in my leg. Man, some of my uh, my lines got I think, I think got by drawn by in the wrong way. I was trying to talk. <laughs> oh well, it's all good. Now I bought it. Signed. Oh gosh. And I, you know, met him and talked to him, but I had never met him at the time. No, that's not true. I did meet him once in the nineties. I met him. We were outside San Diego, he came up and I was smoking, I used to smoke. And he asked me for a light, and I gave a light and I said, here's Simon Bisley. So, uh, I've got my light kind of roughed in here. And uh, the way that I would work before is I would thoroughly work out my anatomy, make sure that I've got everything uh, situated the way that it needed to be. Uh, especially starting, I, I really found having all of my anatomy really kind of, you can see that didn't quite connect there. Having all my anatomy really kind of worked out was uh, a lot more useful than I really needed it. So, so there's my leg, basically. And then uh, it would be such a huge struggle from there. I couldn't get shadowing working for me, too. And so I'm going to lighten that down again. And I'm just going to work with, and you can see this is not actually heavily lit. And it's such a simple thing, but on this part right here, and I'm going to zoom in a bit. I want you guys to really see this. I'll keep adjusting autofocus. This is going to be a disaster for a second. Hold on. Okay, we're back. All right, zoom. Here we go. Okay. So let me get back to this thing. Okay, so um, I know, but I've got a few of these books. So this part right here, it starts very thin, and that's because my light is coming directly from above, or close enough to above that it might as well be above. And then uh, it's, it's a rounded form, and it rounds under, but the way he's got it, it's actually completely a hard shape that goes out like this. And it's just such a great shape, and that shape right there was already, I, I could tell like almost right away, I was like, holy crap, this is working. Like, it just made sense. I could understand it. And I, that's so much of what it comes down to when you're looking at art is, uh, there are artists that I think are incredible, and it just, it doesn't make sense for me. And he just had such an incredible way, for an artist that's so over the top of his detail, had such an incredible way of breaking down a figure into something that's very, very simple and direct and just clean. And so he's got that line kind of coming out here. And then this muscle here, he's got defined basically with a shape just like this. He's got a bit of a shadow. He's got the hand over it covering some of it. I'm going to ignore that. And I can see it here. I, uh, get my mouse. Hold on. I can see it here. I think you can kind of see it there. It's paint. Um, it's very subtle, and this is something I'm going to switch after this drawing. I'm going to switch to his black and white art because it's a little more simple to kind of see all the shapes. But I still want to try and capture some of that what he had there. It's just a really cool, even with paint, a really cool shape that he's got there. Love it. And just a bit of a line here that connects in there. And, I mean, that's it. And look how great that looks. It's like the best leg I've drawn in here. I need to do this more. And then, 
that there's a head cutting off the bottom there. And uh, so yeah, that was like the first thing that I did. And already I thought, wow, you know, what a massive difference this is for my work. I couldn't believe it. And so from there, um, I can't remember what I did next. And so I'm not going to try. But what we are going to do is switch over to my sign. It goes back. And let's quickly see how Eric has come along with his. So, so is it is it his work where you uh, started um, looking at connection points and sort of detailing those heavy? Yeah, yeah, it really is from Simon Bisley. It's actually it's a mixture of two things. I've learned a lot from Ashley Manson, who was a colorist at Top Cow, um, and he really taught me about connection points, especially and la overlapping forms uh, using connection points. So, and uh, I've done some videos on that. Um, yeah, I'm just going to switch back quickly, and then we'll switch back just so I can show this, Eric. But um, now, a connection point really is, I've, I've shown this a few times, but just in case you haven't seen it, I've got a form here, and it's in front of another form here. And I, to the, I'm off the screen. And to define those together, all I really need to do is draw this form here, and then really kind of connect that. And that's a lot like an ambient occlusion, if you're doing like 3D modeling, that kind of thing, where forms kind of connect together, you get like a pooling of shadow. And it creates that effect. So I'm going to do the same thing here, a little less so because we're a little more, I'm imagining my light coming from here. And this will be heavier because it's away from the light. This is just using line weights. But the coolest thing I learned about line weights was that right there. And it really gives me a nice hard kind of a shape. And so that was that was Simon Bisley, especially with with the way that he's designing his, his shadow forms. And Ashley Manson, who I owed a huge debt of gratitude to. I haven't seen Ashley for 25 years. All right. So let's get back to Eric here really quickly. I, I just saw a comment actually. Um, and uh, Jalapeno Chorizo says, I was lucky enough to spend the whole day with Simon at the 1989 UK Comic Convention. He watched one of my Batman 89 badge, which I wouldn't give up. He still sent me a Christmas card for a legend. That's amazing. And I mean, 1989, that's like the right when he was really figuring out a lot of stuff, a lot of his painting stuff. It's uh, would have been very cool to meet him then. Yeah, it's looking really good. So how do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to incorporate those, you know, the, these, these traits that you mentioned before, um, you know. But seeing them in action here in his work is very interesting. I can yeah. see how you started using those to good effect. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that is so much more interesting than, you know, just a round shape or... Right, and by all rights, because it's a rounded shape, it should just be like this. But that just has nowhere near, and I'm drawing off the screen. <laughs> but you did it there, so there you go. I'm just copying what you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. and, that, and that's even more interesting than, than that, which would be a hard shape, you know? By the way, uh, um, Matthew Fuentes wants to point out that you don't have pencil, uh, Dave on your pencil. Yeah. You know, unacceptable. Yeah, I know, yeah, I need to, right? Maybe that's my problem, Dave. I just need to on it. You do. That'll fix everything. Yeah. Logan Jay says, uh, how goes the personal project again? It's going really well. Um, I actually, it's making a lot of headway right now, which is great. Uh, okay. Um, oh, hey, Dan, we'll start this here. I went and visited uh, Dan last weekend. And we're going to be doing some airbrushing together. So uh, I'm going to you know, take some pictures as we go along and, and show you guys. And I was thinking at some point, um, when I kind of get the hang of it, I've used airbrush a little bit unsuccessfully. So I'd really like to uh, get a little bit better with it. It'd be nice to have Dan on um, and do something with airbrush. It could be a lot of fun. OK. So I'm kinda, there are ah, that's where I'm messing videos, up. But there's Got one it. thing in particular that I really want to start with. This issue. This is the first time I ever saw Simon Bisley stuff. I'm gonna have to pull out. Oh, the art. Yeah. yeah. And I actually, I'm. I have to admit, <laughs> and I'm a huge fan of uh, Sam Keith, and I'd love to do something with Sam Keith actually at some point too. But I bought it for the Sam Keith cover, which uh, you can see right here. Check that out. That is such an awesome cover, and I loved it. I was so amazed that I had never seen his work before either. This was like one of the first times, or maybe the first time I went to a comic shop. And uh, so I opened up the book, and it's a different artist. I thought, what's going on? And then I thought, oh, OK. Yeah, I could, 
can live with that. I mean, look at this. That arm is bananas. It's absolutely ridiculous. And the figure, though, that I really wanted to start with was this right here, and especially this stomach area. Uh, and we're not just going to do, you know, simple shapes. I mean, the shapes are so genius in here. There's a lot, but I wanted to start with that. And then just past that. Uh, oh, wow. Right there. Look at how crazy that is. Yeah, that's and, this anatomy gets crazy. You know, he was really being experimental at the time. I mean, nobody's done anything like this. And I think it's in that light, too. I think that would be good to give it a try. Anyway, yeah, nobody had ever done stuff like this. So it was a very kind of a new thing. And uh, he, was, he was a revolutionary artist. OK, so I'm going to just quickly start to get my, uh, my chest in here. I can already tell I'm going to have trouble with his stomach. Think so? I think it'll help if you don't look at it just as the shapes. You have to draw the underlying form first and then use the shapes over it. Yeah, yeah. Like use them to, because what he's doing, he's interpreting anatomy. And it's just using his interpretation, but using your knowledge of anatomy on you know? So I'll be curious to see how it works out. So I've got one leg here. The other leg is kind of here. I have to admit, a lot of his anatomy, I'm hugely influenced by him, but much more in his detailing than some of the actual Okay, so I've got my chest, my rib cage basically here. You can see he's got a real definition for it. So as long as I have my rib cage kind of in, then he's got her chest, her breasts here. And we're not going to draw that. that but we're not going to draw that. <laughs> uh, and so for my stomach, the way I always lay out the stomach is um, I've got my, my rib cage and then I like using this kind of a shape here. Yeah, so that's where I'm going to go. I don't see the... It's not right. Actual. So you kind of have to interpret. Yeah. So, so what I'm going to do... I, so I see that triangle portion of the rib cage. I'm, I'm going to draw... Oh, gonna draw shit. That shape here, Whoops. And then this one here. And then I'm just oh, well. going to rough in what I know first. And then the lower stomach goes here. He's got her... I want to say oblique. Oh, fuck it. I can't remember. I'm it's already right here. Probably, Might as well. Like Might as well do it now. He's got it kind of going all the way into the hip. So it's very unusual. Like the oblique would be up here and the hip is here. He's defined it all as one thing. So I'm going to do that. But there we go. And then some detail down there. Uh, and then the leg. I'm not going to worry about this leg either. And then he's got this one. And this is something he is so great at. And it, it's. Uh, I wish I could say, oh, yeah, I do that really well, but nobody does it, anything like Simon Bisley. So he's got this one stretch, and you can really see that stretch in there. And then he's got that same muscle kind of structure here, and he's got it defined like it's really being crushed. And so it gives like a, just a real sense of reality to that figure. It's really incredible. OK, so I've got it roughed in. <clears throat> my mouse actually died just before we did this, did this stream. I had this smack on the table, it came back to life. So I'm afraid every time I use it, but I wanted to, couldn't see the chat. So my card says, I'm so tempted to do this right now. You really should try it. And you know, if not right now, you have to try it soon. It, it's, it was, um, you know, I want to say it was life changing for me. Actually, I think that's not unfair to say because, uh, and. I don't know if I ever said this before. Raymond Peterson was was an artist at Top Cow. Uh, he's a, a Marvel artist. He's he's worked for DC. He's incredible and uh, is a good friend still. And um, he was more established at the time. And he's very honest, <laughs> maybe too honest. I don't know. And uh, after I started making some of this work, and it was really kind of making sense to me, he said, "Yeah, it's a really good thing that." You know that came together for you because uh, they were looking at maybe just letting you go. They were what? They were looking at maybe just letting you go. Oh no! I was like, oh man, thanks Brandon, killing me. And you know what? They probably were. I was. I'm really. I can't tell you how much I was struggling. I'm not a natural. Okay. So 
I've got my basic sheet kind of drawn in here, and I can see underneath where I want to get these forms. So I've, and I've got this one, and hopefully you can see that on the screen. So I'm going to use it, set it to find very thin here, and then he's actually got a bit of a pocket of shadow that he's drawn under, just like that. Looks awesome, doesn't it? Like two yeah. Minutes. Well, not really. This is Simon Bisley. And something he does I've never done. Actually, um, I worked with uh, Sandra Hope. She's a, an anchor for DC. Uh, she's incredible. And she actually interpreted some of my work this way a couple of times. And she said, you know what? I'm not sure what you think of it. I could stop doing that. I said, no, don't stop. Like, so I would always draw this as a dark, just a shadow. But the way he's done it, he's actually drawn that as catching some light from below and then cast a bit of shadow below it like this. And this is actually very similar to the image stuff that I couldn't make work, which is why I never picked this up from Simon Bisley. I was so <laughs> embittered by this kind of lighting. But, you know, maybe I should try it now. Be a little more open to it. So, yeah, he's got that sheet right there. And then just <clears throat> below that, he's got her serratus coming in. Very thinly defined here, just a little bit of rendering. He's got that same kind of, you know, we had that on the leg just over here. He's got a very similar kind of a lighting shape here, which is why you learn one of these shapes and you start to use it and it just works everywhere. I mean, look at that, that looks great, I think. Maybe I'm biased. Okay, and so now the other side of the stomach is really pushed up. So he's got something kind of like that. And then he's got the next layer of his stomach muscles. He's got her belly button here. Doesn't really have, it gets a little ill defined there for me. Um, I think it looks perfect, so who can be wrong? But for me to understand it, you know, and that's really sometimes that comes down to it. It's, it's not whether something really is great and works for the artist, it's whether I can understand it and use it in my own work. And sometimes I can't. I'm sure you know what I mean, Eric. But Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Right, right. <clears throat> so we've got that there. And then one more shape really kind of defined here. We cast a shadow over that just slightly. And then it goes into the stomach here. And then that shape right here again, just like that. And I mean, I've been using that basic shape. It really is like the cornerstone of, of how I draw all really from one day in my whole career of just really going in and drawing this and, and realizing how well it worked for me. And that's gonna basically be it. I mean, when you really break this stuff down, you can see it's very, very simple. Uh, he's just incredibly good at, um, and this is why so many people that have copied him have um, had trouble because while his stuff is, is really detailed, and we'll go into some stuff that's much more detailed, the underlying fundamental drawing is, is really, really just solid and simple and very graphic. Mm -hmm. And Tom goes up the drawing board and says, David, does it make sense because he's doing artistic license with the anatomy? Yeah, he is. It, he really he knows what he's doing so much that he can do that. And I mean, we all do it. Uh, to varying degrees of success, but uh, it does mean that when you're looking at an artist, you do have to interpret a little bit. You're going so small. Yeah, I won't see that. Uh... Nice. I can see where he's got like a, a, a bit of a on. On this side here, it's much more of a, and you can see it in the reference, it's much more of a, a flowed line through, and you kind of cut that a little bit. And so it loses a little bit of that pull. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that's, it's like the squash and stretch that's really making that pose, that stomach work so well. It's stretched on this side and then really kind of squashed here. And uh, probably more than I've done it here, actually. I mean, he's got the hip kind of actually more up here. So I just adjusted my hip just a little bit higher, and I think that really kind of sells that stretch just a little bit more. Supersonico says, 
Eric, maybe you need to go bigger. Or at least, did you say zoom in? You're going to zoom in a bit? Yeah, I'm going to zoom in. All right. We're going to move on. You ready? Sure. Okay. I know what I wanted to do next. And that's this one. All right. Global is pretty much the only character I can think of that can wear underwear like that. I'm just going to say a word. <laughs> All right. So this one, I really could do the whole picture. Um, but what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to limit this one to the arm, this area here, and then we'll do the leg. So let me, I, I'll probably have to switch to another paper, paper for the leg. So he's got his lower arm here. I'm already, you can see, look at this, he's got a very short gap here. I'm already kind of, and you know what, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to interpret this my own way. I don't draw like Simon Bisley, and I'm not trying to get the over, like I love how it looks, but um, I need to make it make sense for me. So I'm going to kind of do it my way a little bit and use his detail on top of it, which I think might be more useful anyway, because it's probably more in line with what you guys want to get out of it, I would think. Um, yeah, really, the whole point of doing this kind of thing is, is um, finding techniques to make your work stronger, not just <clears throat> becoming a, a copy machine of another artist. Shoulder kind of in here. Um, so that's basically his head here. That's pretty much all I need for my quick rough in. Oh, and let's get the hand too. You know, Eric, when you're looking, if you uh, see that off camera or something, just shout out to me. Sure. I'm trying to figure out how to interpret that. What's that? His arm, his anatomy is really yeah. wild. Yeah, it's, it's so different. It really is. And, you know, for me, um, for the longest time, I, I still am that way. <laughs> I don't know why I would say like, nothing's changed. I don't think I have enough, uh, eh, we're going to go with it. I don't want to be here all day. Um, there's my arm basically gone in. It already doesn't look as cool, but <clears throat> I think some of the details that he does will help us along. Anyway, he says, those beans be crazy. Oh no, lost my sharper. Alright, uh, El Pacino says, a crazy habit figure looks three-dimensional, only has flat colors. You really need to understand shading to be able to do that. Yeah, you, you really do. Well, you can see why you know, his painting is so incredibly strong. Okay. So, he's really got a, a rounded, it just goes round up here. And I like how he's, I always I, I like just graphically when you can take a form and just flow it directly into another form. I think that's Uh, another chat bar, uh, super chat bar, even one, you know, do you, do you really need to use blue line fence anymore? Have they ever used duo shade paper before they start making it? I've never used duo shade paper. I threw out my blue line pencils, not because they're, I mean, they work. I don't use them because they're very, I don't, I can't get detail with them. They're really frustrating to use. Yeah, um, they are. And they don't erase well. And they don't. <laughs> Yep. So every time I do a cover or whatever, uh, I have to erase the pencils pretty thoroughly, and it's still not perfect, and then it's it's time in Photoshop kind of cleaning things up. So uh, I'm going to kind of sketch in where he's got his veins here. Oh, and thank you for the super chat, by the way. He's um, having really weird thing with his uh, left heel, so it's like a tricep. I think that's how you see his forearm. It's really strange. Yeah. But it looks good, doesn't it? 
And that's why I want to copy it and see what we get out of it, you know? I mean, I did a bunch of this, and I found that even, like, I don't need to draw his anatomy to make these shapes work, and, and the general kind of lessons that I learned from it work for me. Um, and it still, it influenced my anatomy, too, but uh, I would say my anatomy, there's a lot of um, Carlos Pacheco in it, uh, and there's, you know, Frank Rosetta, there's a list of artists that go into it, and when you have a long, a long list of, of influences, you need to get to the point where you can start to put them together and, you know, pick up different ideas from different artists and make them kind of integrate. All right, so I'm going to here really start to speed up here. We're kind of taking a little long. Yeah, the way, the way he's defining the connection between his first knuckle and his thumb is just crazy. Yeah. So he's got his wrist bones defined really, really large and unusual, and you know, uh, obviously that's an artistic choice. I think it looks very, very cool. <clears throat> All Easier. Well, you know, I've been doing this for, you know, 26 more years than I had been doing it at the time. Maybe more. Okay. And uh, so my my chest is just going to be here. It's going to cast a shadow down. <clears throat> Story of my osmosis has a $10 super chat. Thank you very much. It says, hey, hey, hey. New 52 Dark Knight is phenomenally dynamic and was my gateway to modern comics. And Batman in the Rain is awesome. Can you share your thoughts on penciling New 52 DK? And uh, uh, seeing you're doing visually, yeah, and thank you very much. Um, yeah, you know, I, I actually... Uh, I started just before New 52. We did uh, some issues before that. Um, I was working with Scott Williams. And uh, we had conversations, you know, what are you kind of looking for? And, I really wanted to try something more Frank Miller inspired and more, you know, this kind of thing where it's it's a little bit more loose. I really had like this idea of of you know kind of going further with it and trying something different. And it didn't go that way, but I still picked up. I was looking at a lot of Frank Miller, and I found that it really helped my my um, shadow placements for backgrounds and you know arranging my shadow shapes. I don't know that you could look at it and say that there's Frank Miller in there though because um, I, I just didn't have the guts to really just go for it. I was looking at a lot of Eduardo Rizzo, too. There's another great artist that way. Um, so for his veins, um, I want to point out that he's only drawing the shadow on the underside of the vein. So and because my light's coming from above, I'm going to draw a shadow in here. And he's also, you notice, he's really using his connection points. He's thicker there, the connection, thicker there, the connection. So he's got another one here. I didn't quite get in there, but get that in there. And, uh, you know, among a lot of other things, this is really where I learned how to draw things. I was looking at Simon Bisley. Uh, Tom Rivello has a super chat. Um, I'm starting at the Cuba school in two weeks. What's the most important thing I should focus on learning? Uh, well, congratulations. It's, it's great, and it's a great school. So I'm sure, uh, I'm sure they'll be able to help that way, and they'll be able to guide you uh, with really everything that you need. But I would say, the number one thing, in my opinion, to concentrate on is anatomy and figure dynamics. Uh, there's there's storytelling and um, uh, composition and a lot of more advanced topics that are incredibly important, inking, a lot of things, but they all pale in comparison to, if you can draw pictures that people viscerally react to, uh, you're going to be a far more successful artist than somebody that can tell a good story. Um, now, I mean, you have to be able to tell a good enough story that writers would be willing to work with you, but uh, it is, you know, whether you agree or not, and I understand if you think, yeah, it's garbage, but I, it really is very true. Uh, being able to draw really cool, shaping the heck out of my camera, uh, dynamic figures is, is very, very important. So I would really focus on that. <clears throat> 
got some phrases in here. Across his chest, and you can see they all fan out from this point here. And he really he knows his anatomy. And I love how he shaped this muscle here. So it's got a bit of a curve, and then cuts like that. And then it, it actually continues and curves in all the way over here. It's just a very cool shape and so much more interesting than if I was to just to, to just draw a line across. Uh, and you know, th this kind of thing right here is, is so much what makes a big difference between something that really has like a cool visual dynamic and something that doesn't. It's not really your understanding of anatomy. Yeah, it certainly can be, but a lot of times it's much more just your the graphic quality that you can throw your shape down with. And he gets pretty heavy here. It's going to start to fumble that in and try and do it without shaking my camera everywhere. I think I was saying last year, Eric, that I was going to replace my camera and get something that's over the desk, so I'm not doing that all the time. Uh -huh. Yeah, haven't done it. <laughs> By the way, uh, this is going to be the last stream for a couple weeks because Tomorrow morning, I've got my office mostly cleaned out. Uh, tomorrow morning, I've got somebody coming in to finish the drywall. Yeah, it was just never happening with me doing it. So I got, you know, one wall of drywall in, I got framed in, I got the ceiling done, and then I just had to admit that it was never going to happen. So we have someone coming in tomorrow. It's going to be a couple weeks to get it drywall painted, everything done. I'll be able to get back in my office. But until then, uh, I'm not really going to have the ability to stream. So Dave, I've noticed he's, he's doing the same thing on his chest that he did with the with the um, the, the female figure we drew before. He's got that same triangular shape. He's wearing a triangular shape. Here, I'm gonna switch over so you can show me what you mean. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure I, I know what you mean, but yeah. So over here, the shape over here. Oh yeah, yeah. So he's got the same same deal. Yeah, which is just much more visually interesting than, you know, just curves everywhere. Yeah. Arms looking good. Definitely going to see a lot. Yeah. I do feel like you're a little straight on this, on the, the side closer to your hand, where your hand was. Like the outside of the arm. Yeah, uh, on the, yeah, on the forearm, it, come, it should kind of come out higher. Like more from the elbow. There, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So, uh, part of the reason I really wanted to do this arm is the stuff in here. And I'm going to zoom in quickly so you guys can really see what I'm talking about. And RC's design says, a couple weeks, I can drywall finish and paint it in four days. Yeah. You know what? Actually, he said that, but he's very busy. So, it's going to be, he won't be able to do it all in completely one shot. And I have to put it in four. So, okay. So the way that he's got these shapes here is really interesting. And he's kind of defining both sides of it. So it's like a, a raised kind of a tube, the way that he's defined that muscle. Uh, and there are other places in here where you can see him kind of doing that. And I've been doing that to some extent for years. And I really kind of got it from, from this arm and a couple other ones. And you know, we'll cover some of those in a bit too. But come back out. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, so he's got that muscle coming out here. And he's kind of defined shadow on both sides of it, but he's also, he kind of, if I lower the shadow around it, it looks like it tucks up into the, uh, the muscle that's above it. And he's got another muscle kind of defined here. And then it goes into like a, a tube. It's kind of defined, but not completely. And my shape placement isn't exactly the same, but, you know, not the point. All right. And then he's done the same thing here, so he's kind of defined it like a tube. I love how he's got that. And then he's got some kind of nice looking wrinkles in here. And his massive wrist bones. And then he's got uh, a vein here, a vein here, 
So he's drawing just a little bit of the vein and then just drawing the shadow right there and it really kind of sells as like this overall vein. I can do the same thing here, bring this out a little bit. Maybe you, more you, you know, you can't just randomly put down shapes and do what he, he does here. He definitely knows what to say. He definitely knows the edit. You know, he understands where all these ligaments fit and then he pushes it, you know? Yeah, it's about understanding uh, enough major landmarks. And he really accentuates it. This is something I, I love about his anatomy is he's got these bones on his wrist and they're crazily accentuated. But it really works because, you know, you've got that bone right there, and, you know, so it, it gives everything, it grounds everything, so his anatomy is like crazy and huge and crazy, <laughs> but it, you know, it doesn't just fall apart into something that ends up looking um, kind of maybe soft and doughy or... Not thinking of the words, but, and then a lot of this stuff is just little, little details, it's really not even all that important for the final. Um, well, it is to get the look that he's going for here, but in terms of um, what I'm trying to get out of this, it's it's much more the bigger shapes. You know, I have to say, Eric, this is going to be one where we're not going to end up doing our own, like, you know, put the book aside and, and redraw it. Oh, man. Because it's so... What's that? It'll be virtually impossible. Yeah, well, and it's, it's so not the point with this. The point for me is it's just getting the feel for his shapes that he's using. Like he's got this great triangle defined there, and then below that, he's got that kind of defined. And between the two of them, it, it gives it like a, it looks like a, a really hard ledge there. And you really have to, it's one thing to, to watch this, I think, or to look at his work, but you know, you really have to give it a try with your hands. I think it'll really get So the minute you the minute you cut this shape out, you know, you you get another shape under it as well. Yeah. Just by virtue of the fact that they want to shape a certain way. Yeah. So Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Tyler L says, uh, oh sorry, Tyler L says, is this a piece of work that when you were when you were learning? And yeah, it is actually. I'd say uh, it, it really is. Um okay. You ready? Yeah. Kind of flip through here and find something else. is uh kind of oh wait we're sorry here let me switch up there this is like a send off on you know some poses that were very popular at the time so every time this character appears like he's here and then they show him from different angles but he's always got like the big one like, oh, crap, yeah. that's funny all right hmm. i'm thinking i might want to try that right here I'm going to just zip ahead quickly and see what else we got. There's so much in here. That's very similar with the way he's on the arms. I love the stomach. 
very, very cool. Okay. I'm thinking about doing this one. What do you think, Eric? I want to do the whole thing. Okay. And you know what? Uh, when I was first learning, uh, I did this whole thing, so I remember doing this one. Okay, it's not a big event. And this is why I said before I'd love to do Lobo. Uh, it's because of this work. You know, I feel like I'm a little um, not quite in focus. But I don't know that I'd be really the right artist for it because I don't have the sense of humor in my art at all that that this stuff has. So it's probably not really right for me as much as I'd love to do it. Okay. I'm going to start with the head. It's just right about here. I'm sure it's so sweet in there. His arm mostly is in shadow, and I've done this a million times where I want to push an arm back. And you just shadow it out like that, and really, really, I love how you've got a real plane here, a plane here, and a plane here, and it's differentiated with shadow. Something I really got from this stuff. I remember I was drawing Rick Cloth, I was drawing Cyber Force when I started doing this. And uh, I was doing a Cyber Force annual. And is that right? It's been too long. Anyway, um, and I, I started drawing Rick Cloth more like this kind of style where he's coming out of shadow and all of a sudden it's just, you know, it's just really working. So this is why I really wanted to do this figure. So I'm going to go ahead. He also draws the stomach in more of a realistic way than I do. That was something I really had to make a decision about early on is I like the, uh, here's my superhero drawing. Here's my chest, my shoulders here, and then you've got the, it's like a, almost like a plate from the rib cage that goes underneath that. And I like that look. And you can kind of shadow that out. Um, whereas this is more of a natural kind of a style. And so yeah, I struggled with that quite a bit and I finally made the decision to keep going the way that I was going with more of a superhero look. But that was a tough one. There's never a right answer on these, you know what I mean? You're working. I'm interrupted. Okay. So let me. Uh, yeah, I mean, you gotta, you gotta pick what you. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's a way to tell how many artists are actually in, in, in your work right now. There is probably many, and maybe even some that you don't realize as well. Yeah. Oh, well, there are, and I mean, there are artists that I've never looked at that I'm very influenced by. I. Uh, just because I'm so influenced by artists that were influenced by them. And it really is a, you know, years pass, and all these influences are passed down from generation to generation. It's such a mistake to uh, not pick up on that. And you really, I think the, the best artists are the artists that um, they do that. The, really, the best artists are the artists that they grow uh, the medium. In a, way, in a way, like Jim Lee, I think, is, is one of those artists where you can see his influences, and I can say, you know, there's Kevin Nolan, and there's uh, some Arthur Adams, and there's a few things, but there are things that nobody had done. Uh, I don't know where he got it. It's just, you know, it was like lightning in a bottle. He really, really uh, reinvented a lot of things, changed the business. I, was, I remember drawing this face, and I could not make it. We'll see how it goes this time. All right. <clears throat> Henry Germer says, Jay Lee doing the whole would, would be nice to see his neighbor stuff is cool. Yeah, he, he's such a different artist from when he did Namor. I mean, huge, huge fan of what he does now. I was a huge fan of his Namor stuff. Uh, and I remember trying to draw some of that way back before I broke my comic, trying to draw some, of the, some pictures from Namor. Okay, so I've got 
kind of like him down. And uh, I'm going to start with the head because uh, because I'm going to start with the head. Oh no. All right. So already the eye shape is so wild for me. I would never do that. And it was one of those things that I know when I was looking at stuff, I, I thought, okay, there are things that I can make work, and then there are things that are, I mean, they look amazing when he does it, and you I couldn't do it. So I, I never tried. His nose, I had, it's, so it's a straight line, straight line here, like this, and then like this, it's very, very angular, and then it's just basically straight right there. Uh, there's actually an artist, um, uh, I'm not going to remember, who am I kidding? Uh, he's he's a, <laughs> uh, an English artist. Anyway, uh, his style is, is similar in a lot of ways, um, and he does like a really, he's been around for a long time, I think longer than Simon Bisley. And like this kind of thing here, where he's very angular and graphic, is something that he was doing uh, before Simon Bisley. And I wonder, and I, I think it's very likely that uh, Simon picked up some of that from him. And if I knew the name, I would say it. I know the name. I just can't remember my own name. Kevin O'Neill, thank you, Tombo. Almost drawing board, got it in one. Kevin O'Neill, thank you, yes. Kevin O'Neill actually even did a, so I'm just going to shadow this whole slide out, uh, a Lobo, I think it was a convention special, it was hilarious. So Lobo goes to a convention and uh, he reviews artists' work and then crashes them and kills a few of them. And, you know, <laughs> it's very funny. I'm just going to simplify this. Just into a band. Uh, now, some of the things that I, when I was learning how to draw, I tended to simplify the hands and the feet because I was so, I wanted to draw cool looking arms, you know? And um, it's a thing that I struggled with for a long time. And I joke about feet, like, aha, I can't draw feet. Uh, okay, well, sometimes I can't. But I, I had to learn over the years to overcome that. It's a real thing that uh, hands were very hard for me. The things that I avoided when I was first starting. You know, and you think, oh, you have all these, like, years to get better at this stuff. But you know what, if you don't consciously, I was way too short with this face based on the proportions. So I'm just kind of changing this as I go. Uh, the things that I didn't concentrate on early on are, to this day, weaknesses. And some of them I've, I've gotten better at. But they'll never feel as natural as the stuff that I really worked on before I broke in. I don't know why, you know. I th you know what, I, I guess I know why. You, uh... You learn tricks, you know? And you learn you tricks. Oh, yeah, let me do this. Just shade that whole thing in. Man, this guy's almost looking like Snake, man. All you had to do was give him a headband and uh, some some uh, some mullet style, and he's <laughs> looking like Snake. Holy shit, that's what's up. Well, yeah, man, that's gonna be the end of this video. Hopefully, uh, yeah, these two are interesting. You can definitely see like similar color palettes, but definitely a big change. And, you know, again, this was just the inspiration from two photo bashes I did a while back. Um, here, I'll throw them up real quick. So this was one with this as when I was trying to work out ideas. Now I look at this, it looks sad. And this is another one which looks even more sad. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, this this is uh, that. I was thinking about adding um, some tattoos to this design, but honestly, the drawing is so small uh, to really incorporate a lot of the tattoos. So I'm, I'm just going to let this rock. And, 
you know, maybe on like larger illustrations of this guy or, you know, characters with tattoos and stuff like that, I could actually like throw in some decent tattoo work. But, you know, tattoos actually work really weird um, within light and reflections and all that other stuff, man, because, I mean, maybe if your skin is dry in a well-lit room, like, yeah, the tattoos are as clear as day. But if you're, like, sweating and you're, you know, you have, a, like, a layer of sheen on you, like, those tattoos almost never get picked up at all. So, uh, that's kind of how I imagine this scene right now. Uh, maybe that's just me making excuses up. Either way. <laughs> Uh, that's gonna be the end of this video. I'll be back for one more tonight. It'll probably, I'll, I'll probably be like super low energy on the next one. Just cause, uh, yeah man, that, that call from my mom definitely woke me up and gave me, <laughs> gave me something to like kind of focus and, and, and latch onto. And, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm super tired, especially when it comes to these cause it's like 2 a.m. now, it's past 2 a.m. Uh, but yeah, I like these, man. I, I like it a lot. They they worked out. I, I like uh, I like how these came out because I've been doing a lot of these and and everything that I've been working on with these portraits. They all look very similar. They all look really good. You know what I'm saying? Which is fine. But yeah, getting with the uh, the character a little bit more body, a little bit more uniform. It's actually like uh, when when I'm working on these. Oh wait, let me turn one more. When I'm working on these uh, full body drawings, how they're all different. These don't. You know, they're not colored or anything like that, so you don't really see what's going on. So yeah, when I have uh, like these, it's like a, a nice middle ground between the colored portraits and then the pencil sketches of the full body uniform or outfits and things like that. Um, yeah, it, so I, I really like these, man. I, I'm, I'm really loving this series. I'm, I'm loving this character. I'm really happy that I'm doing all this. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the phone call with uh, my mom. <laughs> yeah, she's cool, man. Um, but she 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 lives in a out out of the country, so um, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe one day when she moves back to the states, uh, she she can get on stream. Maybe I'll, I'll have a camera at that point to film myself while I film these things. Anyways. Uh, that's it. I'm G Mr. Drew at G Mr. Drew on all socials. Follow, like, and subscribe. You know the deal. Any and all support is appreciated. Check out my website, gmrdrew.art. You can see everything I've worked on, digital art. Oh, not everything, but mostly everything that goes back like 20 something years. Uh, everything from sketchbooks to professional work. And then there's professional work that I can't post, but eh, it is what it is. You know, animator, illustrator, graphic designer. I did all that stuff. And uh, now I'm just trying to make it on my own <laughs> and uh yeah man it's good beginnings so yeah check it out anyone and everyone who's still watching these videos man i love y'all and uh yeah man stay tuned I'll, I'll keep these videos coming and yeah i got another one coming up what the hell am i gonna work on now is it gonna be another beast beast form monster yeah might as well might as well while i'm here so that's it man Peace.